I can't hear. Yes. Uh, sir, there is no audio, sir. Mm. Sir, there is no audio, sir. So that's some glimpses of our university, sir. These are some glimpses of our university. Absolutely lovely. I'm I'm delighted to see it. Yeah, the alumnus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alumni. Including Sri Aurobindo. Oh my god. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. We have almost 35 Padma awardees in our uh, university. And one Nobel Laureate, one Jan Feet. <laughs> Wonderful. Is that Venkata, Venkata Krishnan? Ramakrishnan, right? Ramakrishnan, I knew. Yeah, I know his father. Yeah. Yes. This is the yoga son. <laughs> yes. When was this university established? Uh, sir, it was established as a Baroda College in 1881. And then the present status of the university came in 1949. The Maharaja Sahajirao University of Baroda. Hmm. Welcome, Nain, sir. Welcome. Okay. Hello. Okay, start. Hello, good morning to everybody. Honorable Vice Chancellors, Sir Professor Parimal Vyas, Sir, respected Professor Panka Joshi, Sir, Professor P. S. Loknathan, Sir, Professor Ajay Ghatak, Sir, Professor Asok Singhvi, Dr. Madhusudan Ji, Professor Arun Pratap, Professor K. N. Joshi Pura, Professor Dr. Jain, all physics educators and the participant of this webinar. On behalf of organizing committee, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all at the opening of the webinar series, Century of Quantum Mechanics and Still Going Strong, which is jointly organized by Applied Physics Department, Faculty of Technology and Engineering, MS University, Indian Physics Association Baroda Chapter, Gujarat Science Academy, National Academy of Sciences, and Indian Association of Physics Teacher Regional Council RC7. Sir, we sincerely thank our eminent speakers and our invited guests for honoring our invitation in spite of a very busy and a tight schedule. My dear students, our eminent speakers have made a powerful contribution in the field of research and physics teaching. They have established themselves as an excellent teacher and pioneer researcher. Dear students, 
we are sure that this seminar will improve your understanding of the foundation of quantum mechanics along with its latest applications i wish you a extremely fruitful and pleasant webinar without taking your much time i will request now professor arun pratap who is a dean of faculty of technology and engineering of ms university president of ipa baroda chapter a president of original council rc7 of indian association of physics teachers and a pioneer researcher in the field of thermal physics and condensed matter physics to give a brief overview of the webinar series so with this brief introduction i would request professor arun pratap sir to give a brief overview of the webinar series over to you sir arun pratap sir yes good morning everybody I, am i audible yes sir yeah yeah yes so uh, thank you dr tusar pandya ji yes sir uh, we, we are starting with uh, a teacher who is insa best teachers awardee and it is it's good that we will be ending with another insa best teacher awardee professor pk jha yes sir honorable vice chancellor professor parimal vyas sir professor pankaj joshi sir provost charu set professor subramanian loknathan uh, popularly known as mani and called by professor ghatak professor ajay ghatak yes, another pioneer speaker today all my friends professor ken joshi pura general secretary iapt uh, national body it's a pleasure to give an overview of what we are going to listen to for next year i try kiya by the time kuch kuch duniya bhar ka karte rahe fir aaya ki mai kaun fire and tip par ho gaya not permit okay facebook bhi chalu kiya so this basically we thought of this uh, webinar and uh, i must uh, thank uh, uh, professor joshi pankaj joshi for his uh, uh, support and not only that for his margadarshan in this regard and also all my young friends for their support and wh whatever we are starting today <laughs> it's a result of that uh, the title it was uh, floated and it was very well received that century of quantum mechanics and is still going strong then two people naturally came to our mind and they they were the professors pioneer workers and pioneer writers authors professor ghatak and professor loknathan so we thought of requesting this famous duo of <laughs> professor ghatak and professor loknathan for this particular webinar they are the ultimate as regards the quantum mechanics not only in india but their book the famous book quantum mechanics theory and applications it is uh, taught all over the world it is obvious from the response received from 17 countries apart from india there are 17 countries from where including usa uk we have uh, received the response uh, of the people and we have more than uh, 5000 people attending this particular webinar either through zoom or through facebook the duo of professor ghatak and professor loknathan is i, I sh we should not un uh, underrate them but i can make a rough comparison with the famous demos uh, uh, opening duo of uh, sachin and sehwag or sachin and saurav here i should say, say to say that sachin uh, professor ghatak is sachin and as regards professor loknathan he is, he is a combination of the two that is sawad and saurav because he can play both handed he can he can write equally well on the blackboard with left hand as well as right hand i think professor ghatak knows it yes sir yeah so uh, 
professor loknathan being the senior partner he volunteered that he he will take the strike first and we have to bow down to whatever he says so he he is taking the strike first today and he uh, he is putting his uh, younger partner to the non striking end that is one uh, then the, the topic uh, which uh, they are going to speak professor loknathan will open with the history of quantum theory and uh, professor ghatak will talk about the evolution of quantum theory uh, and then tomorrow we have uh, lectures by professor pankaj joshi who is trying to script new chapter in gujarat by opening a very good center of cosmology at charuset that is what he was telling and i believe that it has great scope he will be talking on another aspect of uh, quantum mechanics that is quantum cosmology tomorrow then we have a very popular teacher from our university who teaches uh, quantum mechanics and other subjects equally well with very uh, with quite a lot of passion professor vian portbare again he is a phd from rochester in new york and uh, he is a very popular teacher he is going to uh talk on uncertainty principle uh we should not be uh misled by his the title uh, of his talk because he is very certain about whatever he is teaching after that uh in the same series on the third day we will have the youngest of the lot that is dr anand kumar jha uh, he will be from i uh, he is from iit kanpur and he will be talking about quantum entanglement he will be introduced by none other than professor harish chandra verma so on the third day we will see the appearance guest appearance of professor uh, harish chandra verma uh, padma shri professor harish chandra verma he has promised that he will bless this seminar with his uh, um, uh, words and also introduce dr anand kumar jha and last but not the least we will have a lecture of the application of quantum mechanics on the uh on material in the area of materials design by a very uh, enthusiastic and very strong worker uh, professor prakul prafull kumar jha so this is the outline here i would like to tell you one thing that uh talking to professor loknathan i just uh, uh, told him that you are phd from columbia is that right he said although he has said not to tell all these things but i'm telling and then i said your thesis i came to know is less than having less than 50 pages he said oh, i said 50 pages he said less than that but don't mention it i am mentioning it with, with uh, excuse from uh, uh, professor loknathan then he said one thing we, which shows his forthrightness his honesty he says that arun but not due to the work which i did with him i i salute the honesty of professor loknathan and Uh, at this is also that at 91 the he was same professor loknathan when i spent uh, very fruitful times not so much as regards uh, the interaction but as a person and as an administrator in university of rajasthan during 86 to 94 when i was there fortunately he was he was also there up to 94 i was also a faculty he was a very very senior faculty he uh, worked as a dean and not as an academician as an ad administrator also uh, as a dean of science i uh, try to um, uh, follow him because he was very forthright as regards administration and was very honest so uh, and i am very happy that he has accepted the invitation to come to the, this webinar and address this bless the younger younger lot bless bless the coming generation and i am really th thankful from the heart another point which i want to mention is about prof, uh, professor harish chandra verma padma shri professor harish chandra verma he I, i was talking to him he has published nearly 150 papers in the mostly in the area of mosbat in iit kanpur he said to me i again i salute his honesty he said arun mai siri research mein kabhi bahut serious nahi raha then i told him i know that you did जिसमें आपको मजा आया तो हमने हम यही कहेंगे 
इन माई कैपेसिटी टू माई यंगर जनरेशन वो चीज करो जिसमें मजा आए यू एंजॉय इट उनको साइंस पॉपुलराइजेशन फिजिक्स पॉपुलराइजेशन में बहुत मजा आया ही एंजॉय इट एंड ही गॉट पद्मश्री एंड वी बिकॉज ही गॉट इट इन जनवरी थ्रू दिस मीडियम और थ्रू दिस वेबिनार वी कॉन्ग्रेचुलेट हिम ऑन दिस इव ही विल अपियर ऑन थर्ड डे आई एम श्योर ही एज सेट ओके सो दिस इज अबाउट द वेबिनार नाउ इट विल बी अ प्लेजर फॉर मी to introduce our honorable vice chancellor professor parimal vyas to the audience uh yeah so perhaps i, I will not uh, read this because i know him personally yes, and i know a lot about him so he is uh, uh, actually yes, dual professor of uh, management yes, studies as well as he is professor of uh, 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 professor in the faculty of commerce so he is dual professor and he has the honor of that and then he is uh, he when he uh, took over as vice chancellor regular vice chancellor in 2016 january sorry february then he has the credit or he we owe to him that our university got a grade in his leadership we have lot of faith in his dynamic leadership and he is always for the best so we we are trying our level best many a times we are not able to match whatever he says but then we are trying our best he also is a member of nac peer committee where he has been uh, chairman there also and in in uh, 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 he is also a council member of the nba national board of accreditation then he has been member of national uh, many national committees of ugc or care journals uh and the executive mem member of state higher education council of the government of gujarat so under his leader leadership i that told you we got a a grade and we are looking forward to improve it by uh, getting either a plus or a plus plus we hope and we trust we have full confidence that we will be able to do this uh, or get, get it and with the blessings of all of you with such a stalwarts of uh, our uh, area of uh, physics i hope we will be able to get that then uh actually the list goes along he is for e governance in the university did lot, he, he has taken a lot of steps for this e governance and for going paperless in the university and so far we have uh, been matching with any top university of india and uh, we will be able to uh, ho we hope that we will be able to go to uh, top top rank universities still we are doing very well so uh, i am thankful to him that uh, he he accepted our request for organizing this event and uh, uh, we are here sir and i hope that uh, we will come to uh, your expectations and we will have a good meeting and students and fraternity in general teachers also and other academicians will get benefited from this particular webinar Uh, now i request uh, professor parimal vyas sir the honorable vice chancellor to make opening remarks about the webinar namaskar suprabhat i hope i am audible to all of you yes sir yes sir yes yeah. yes uh, so nice of you and uh, uh, it's a it's a matter of great pleasure and privilege for the maharaja sahajira university of baroda i congratulate professor arun pratap uh, syndicate member of the maharaja sahajira university of baroda uh, dean of the uh, faculty of technology and engineering and uh, also the former head of the department of applied physics and uh, uh, let me uh, before i uh, share some of my thoughts i am a professor of management uh, by the profession but then uh, uh, as Ar uh, professor arun uh, very correctly uh, shared with all of you um, we had actually scheduled this uh, webinar last month in the preliminary discussion probably after uh, i had a long talk with professor pankaj joshi provost of charuset who is an alumnus of the uh, maharaja sahajira university of baroda who is also with us and uh, who is a president of the gujarat science academy my heartiest congratulations greetings to both of you for steering and uh, you know for the efforts that you put in i could see today the galaxy of uh, you know stalwarts in the area of physics uh, they are with uh, us today and uh, 
professor loknathan uh, former professor of uh, uh, physics uh, rajasthan university uh, let me uh, share professor rajanathan with you uh, that uh, university of rajasthan is a second home for me more than 200 uh, you know teachers of uh, my fraternity they are with uh, 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 me in on various uh, social media and it is i've heard a lot about you and your phd thesis uh, just to share a secret whenever me and professor on pratap we talk about the research he always mention about the phd thesis of yours uh, today i am i am fortunate enough that you have uh, decided to be associated with us uh, we have another you know eminent uh, uh, expert with us uh, professor ajay uh, from the national science academy of india so welcome we welcome you uh, padma shri professor hc verma from iit Ken kanpur and uh, i am very happy that uh, these uh, webinar which would happen for 3 days uh, it would be supported with our own professor vinay potavare ji uh, who is a former professor of applied physics of our university professor anand kumar ja iit kanpur and let me share secret with you that when we talk about the uh, research profile of our university there is one name which you know always comes up on the top is professor pk ja uh, he has also made a huge contribution and uh, uh, he is known nationally and globally for his contribution in the area of physics uh, i also appreciate the support that the university has received from uh, indian association of physics te uh, physics teachers uh, national science academy gujarat science academy and indian physics association baroda chapter i also appreciate the support that we have received from professor navin jain the secretary of the gujarat science academy dr tushar pandya ji dr jignesh pandya uh, professor kn joshi pura i'm very happy to have you to because there are two joshi puras one in rajkot and the another in sardar patel university i was with the sardar patel university professor joshi pura uh, thanks for the support to this event and uh, i will just take couple of minutes now if i missed out anybody please uh, you know apologize me but then uh, more than 5000 registrations and more than 500 people they are with you i believe this is going to be a truly interesting international event there are some registrations i believe professor arun pratap has shared the details with me so in fact thanks to covid 19 all our academic activities i believe Uh, that one good thing that has happened just imagine close your eyes arun pratap ji and think of that if you want to invite so many experts at uh, the maharaja sajira of university of baroda i believe you would be required to spend more than 6 months you know to plan out your event and so on and so forth so i think thanks to there are a lot of positivities we are heading towards yeah, exactly. new next yeah. transformational yeah, normal yeah, and i am so happy i am really encouraged today to see the bhishma pitama of physics uh, professor loknathan he is also with us i think uh, no one can dare to say indians that no we are techno savvy we live we lead the whole world the other day i was listening to professor kasturi rangan uh, the you know the, we are going we are awaiting the national education policy under his leadership and i think a special mention came of vikram sarabhai you know uh, sarabhai has a very close connections with uh, vadodara and uh, amdavad and the science academy uh, uh, i'll i'll tell you just a couple of minutes for all of you uh, the maharaja sajira of university baroda as dr chakravarti said our roots goes as back as in 1881 the university was set up in 1949 uh, you know the uh, it was the formal establishment and we are not having any affiliated colleges you'd be surprised to not when we are trying to improve the gross enrollment ratio now our family has now the strength of 45000 students with about 1500 plus teachers out of that around 200 or more of them they are professors full fledged professors where they are the pride for the university with 14 faculties and 111 department 111 departments uh, uh, university in fact is consistently making in the times higher education ranking world university rankings and the indian university rankings because we offer undergraduate and postgraduate teaching naturally you know the teacher student ratio that is why we not been able to you know 
get ourselves into first 100 of the national instop ranking framework but i'm sure my team and the efforts that you put in uh, maybe in the near future you would find the university would also feature into nirf ranking just to give you glimpses of the research profile because i believe the intellectual capital of science is today with uh, this webinar the number of publications in last 3 years in the scopus that have been indexed is around 70 100 the university h index is 90 and the number of research projects in last 3 years is around 156 with the mobilization of 104 crores the university teachers i think i owe it to all of them we have mobilized the consultancy of 170 crores and the funding that has come through consultancy projects is around 8 crores in last 3 years on an average, 350 PhDs we have produced in the last three years and about 950 plus PhDs, we are currently pursuing PhD in the Maharaja Sahajira of University of Baroda. I, as Professor Arun said, uh, we always take a pride that these universities have produced Nobel laureate in form of Venki Krishnan. Some of our programs, I think you would not find the Department of Applied Physics, Applied Chemistry, Applied Mathematics, you know, in the other universities, but at the Maharaja Sahaja University of Baroda, we in fact uh, have a very nice integration of uh, faculty of science focusing on the pure fundamental research, research with the integration that is happening uh, in the uh, faculty of technology and engineering with the departments which focuses on the applications. I believe what I understand, uh, you know, based on little experience that I have uh, as an administrator is that uh, the challenge before all of us is to focus on that whatever research that we carry out. I believe we have to, I don't, I'm not against West. We have to look at the West, but then we have to look at our own legacy. We have to look at our own heritage. We have to look at our own strength. And I, I believe that if we, we, we in fact can capitalize on all those applications which are very much with us, the other day, I was listening to some experts. They were talking about nine floor library that we had in uh, Taksasila or the University of Nalanda that we talk about. I, I believe you know, we all need to put a lot of efforts. Research has to become relevant. I think whatever knowledge that we generate, I, I, that, that uh, pull push has to happen. And I believe uh, the support of all of you would uh, really be an inspiring one for all the attendees where they are in more than 5,000 they are attending, they're going to listen to you. I congratulate Professor Pankaj Joshi and Professor Arun Pratap. Uh, uh, I think for the selection of topic, you know, it is so interesting and inspiring that uh, birth of modern physics, I do not know, but uh, there's one small request which I'll make because so many stalwarts are here. I, I think the foundation of Indian science I, 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 in fact, I have requested Prasarun Pratap also that in the first semester, if we can inspire our young buddies with making them understand about the foundation of the science that we have created in the journey. We belong to that country where I think more than 100 satellites now we have launched. And I think uh, those days have gone. When we were students, we were talking that no, India is a developing country. Today, the whole world is looking at India. I believe we have developed our supremacy as the third world power after India and China. I believe it's a lifetime opportunity that this country has received. And if we really want to make it big, rather than talking from the podium or on the laptop, we really need to put in a lot of efforts. The demographic dividend, which Honorable Prime Minister says, if we really want to capitalize and convert that into a potential assets with a focus on startup and innovation, I think it is the collective responsibility of each and every academician to see to it that we just don't do research for degrees or recruitments or for impact factor or H index or whatever. I believe we need to carry out research which will make difference to the lives of people. Not now, but in the near future. I think uh, that turned around strategy is the uh, need of the day. And I place on record the, uh, uh, you know, my sincere thanks and deep sense of gratitude to all those stalwarts who have come here. Let us not underestimate. It is not just West who can make difference. We have been making difference in the lives of the people all over the world for centuries together. 
we practice and we live a philosophy of vasudev kutumbakam i think uh, we can't think of a life without science first and then technology technology always follows science i always will be- believe that it is only always theory which can enrich practice you can't enrich practice with the theory and i believe the galaxy of uh, you know academicians and researchers who are with us it is it is a matter of great honor for the maharaja sahaji of university of baroda to have all of you here and i pray god that some day when life will become new to normal of course it would be a new economic order our lifestyle will be different the way we will use technology will be different the way we will live the way we will think and the way we will relate and the way we will interact with each other let us look at the positives of it that is the best way to fight the covid and i am sure professor arun will create an opportunity whenever it would be feasible it would be a matter of great pleasure and joy for the university and for me to have you all here in the campus i would request all of you to guide the university the academic curriculum design and development the frontiers of the research that the university has identified along with the thirst areas and i think if we are looking for all problems of the world that we are facing i think the problem lies in education we we will have to take a lead it is we we will have to make a difference to lives of people and uh, my heartiest congratulations to professor arun pratap ji we appreciate the support that you received from professor pankaj joshi ji thank you very much professor pankaj joshi this is what we were expecting uh, you know this is what we strived of and this is what we dreamed of today i hope you also must be feeling very happy that the gujarat science academy along with indian indian science national science academy has brought people of this stature to the maharaja sahaji rav university of baroda and i convey my best wishes to all of you and uh, i wish that there will be lot of intellectual takeaways for the students please do not lo- just look at the certificate that you are going to get please do not do not look at the uh, feedback form that you will be supplied with by the organizers or by my team please listen to experts very very carefully i think i believe a one small spark can change the life of an individual mm-hmm. with that philosophy i request all of you to attend these webinar for three days very very sincerely and uh, i'm sure in near future whenever we want your support all of you would place us all of you would guide us and all of you would inspire us because we uh, represent a, a, you know a culture a philosophy a vision and mission of sir sahaji rao gaekwad where i think he made kanya kelavni girls education free right from the inception of this university so once again thank you very much for a very patient listening and i am sure technology can support would also bless us and you would have wonderful interaction mm-hmm. with the experts in 3 days thank you thank you one and all namaskar thank you very much sir thank you very much for your inspiring and thought provoking thought provoking speech sir we thank you for spending your valuable time sir we have considered your remarks and we will take care thank you very much once again sir uh, friends uh, today we, we we have with us professor pankaj joshi uh, president of gujarat science academy uh, before we invite uh, professor pankaj joshi sir i would like to give a brief introduction of professor joshi sir dear friend uh, pankaj joshi is an internationally eminent scientist he was a senior professor in the department of astronomy and astrophysics at the tata institute of fundamental research mumbai before joining the charotar university of science and technology as a provost and is a founding director for the international center of cosmology more popularly he is regarded as a scholar physicist and expert of cosmology friends he has received, he was he has been awarded many awards and there is a long list of his academic achievements i think uh, today uh, we would like to invite professor joshi sir for his presidential remarks over to joshi sir good morning everybody i hope i am audible to all of you yes sir 
Yes. It's a matter of great pleasure mm-hmm. that the MS University of Baroda mm-hmm. and the Gujarat Science Academy and also the National Academy of Sciences, the NASI and also many other organizations have come together, which have all been named earlier by <coughs> Arun Pratapji. Uh, we have done this uh, very nice event, I think, which is beginning uh, uh, today. And uh, uh, I warmly welcome mm-hmm. on behalf of uh, the Gujarat Science Academy uh, and uh, all other organizations, Professor Lokanathan, Professor Gatak, Professor Ashok Singhweji, and all other, uh, uh, you see, uh, <coughs> wonderful people mm-hmm. and physicists that we have with us uh, today. Uh, well, when we were discussing, <coughs> as uh, Parimalji mentioned just for a moment, this particular seminar, uh, he nudged us, you see, that when, you know, the MS University yeah, yeah. and uh, Gujarat mm-hmm. Science Academy are coming together, uh, why not, uh, you know, we go for not only national, but even an international kind of uh, uh, an event, you know, that would be very impactful. And of course, it is the genius of Professor Arun Pratap to come up with the wonderful idea of 100 years of uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, <clears throat> as after my conversation with uh, uh, Parimalji, I, of course, discussed immediately with uh, Ashok Singhweji, who is my refuge, you see, for any questions I might have. Under his very able uh, leadership, the Gujarat uh, Science Academy has prospered and achieved uh, many uh, new heights. And he said immediately to me that, yes, of course I can, you know, speak to Professor Gatak. And then, you know, whenever you speak to him, you get uh, many wonderful ideas. And that is how the seminar uh, you know, took uh, its roots and uh, uh, we are very happy that we have more than 5,000, uh, you know, uh, listeners uh, and the participants. Uh, well, <clears throat> when I came from TIFR to Gujarat, my main interest was trying to contribute, uh, you know, to education. Because you see, we have these elite institutions uh, like TIFR, where I spent, of course, decades. Uh, we have TIFR, we have Indian Institute of Science, and so on and so forth. But I very strongly feel that much less attention has been paid to our uh, universities where, you know, great people have worked. Today we have Professor Gatak, Professor Lokanathan, we have many others. And the resources which are needed for the universities, I am not really sure that they have been given to them. I mean, we, we, we dedicated a lot of our resources to allied institutions. We had uh, TIFR, we had IISC, then we have IITs. So I hope, you know, to create some kind of uh, an awareness that, uh, you know, an even distribution of resources happen, we gain credit by, you know, this kind of efforts that we are making. Uh, and then we go uh, further. Uh, the Gujarat Science Academy has mainly three, you know, uh, purposes on which we have been working uh, under the, you know, able leadership of the executive, uh, which was earlier chaired by Professor Singhvi and then Professor Nayan Jain, Tushar Pandya, many others have been contributing. And now I am just trying to, you know, follow their footsteps. The first thing that we want to do is uh, to create an awareness of opportunities, great opportunities that the science is offering today. Very unfortunately, in our parents, in our society, it is not very clear to the, uh, you see, society as a whole or the parents that what emerging opportunities are there 
in various sciences for them it is only the engineering it is only the medicine or it is management or law something like that and then they talk about packages that if we spend this much of money if our child spends this many years in the college what will be the package obviously the parents will be concerned about you know the future of their wards but the point is by means of the efforts of the academy such as ours we would like to create an awareness and the first step would be to encourage the creativity and innovation amongst the youth amongst the children and that is what uh, you see we have been discussing intensively professor singhvi professor jain professor pandya and our executive that how on a wider scale at the state level we by means of projects the research projects or you know innovative ideas how we encourage the creativity in our students and youth our second purpose is to create an awareness or impact in education you know the education is uh, we have education minister we have ias uh, principal secretary is they are all trying hard but it is really for us the academics <laughs> to really try to intervene and you know create uh, uh, an environment where we impact the state level as well as the national level education and finally it is creating a scientific temper uh, you know within the community so we are working in this direction and i i will request the eminent physicists present here like professor gatak loknathan and also others uh, you know to work with us to walk with us it should be the journey as professor arun pratap said where all of us should be enjoying and that will bring us you see the real satisfaction and real pleasure i am again uh, extremely happy and that we are collaborating with the ms university uh, where of course uh, i myself studied Uh, you see many years ago and i am an alumnus of uh, so professor vyas parimal vyas is my vice chancellor uh, even though today i appear as the you know uh, provost of uh, vice chancellor of the charusat university very warmly thank you uh, professor vyas uh, it was my conversation with you that is leading to this event and i hope this is only beginning you see you are a person of management and we can't you know underestimate management in the modern uh, despite being you know whatever scientists we are so we need your help we need your guidance we need your support and you know it's so great that uh, we are collaborating with institutions like uh, ms university earlier we collaborated with gujarat university saurashtra university i think our experiences have been very positive i very warmly thank again the ms university and congratulate the you know people who have worked for this event uh, thank you very much yes i am done <clears throat> पंडिया साहब आप अनम्यूट कीजिए थैंक यू वेरी मच सर थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर इंस्पायरिंग स्पीच सर थैंक यू सर अंडर योर लीडरशिप विल डेफिनेटली अपग्रेड द साइंस एजुकेशन एंड अपग्रेड द साइंस टीचर्स सर थैंक यू वेरी मच सर Uh, my dear friends we are very fortunate that today we what we have with us our immediate uh, former president dr ashok singh vij ji sir dear friend our vice president uh, he is our vice president of indian national science academy and honorary scientist of a physical research laboratory in avrangpura dear friend Professor Singh's research area is a quaternary climate and geochronological radiation effect and dosimetry. 
He pioneered in the field of luminescence, dating of desert stands, and provided an understanding of the time evolution of desert across the world. Friend is a fellow of a National Academy of Sciences, fellow of Academy of Sciences, and fellow of Third World Academy of Sciences. Dear friend, he has been awarded with many popular and prestigious awards. Some of them are Krishna Medal Award 1988. Uh, he has been awarded National Medal Award, Ken Shah Award. Dear friend, there is a long list of his academic and administrative achievements. It is difficult to cover here. So with this brief introduction, I request Professor Asok Singhvi sir to address our address the session. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Professor Loknathan, Professor Gatak, Professor Vyas, Professor Joshi, Professor Pratap, Professor Pandya, and all other colleagues. I truly feel privileged and delighted to be with you this morning, and especially with the fact that I'm seeing Professor Loknathan after a gap of 53 years. He may not remember, but I do remember his teaching us in the BSc final MSc classes in 1967-68 at Jodhpur University. I used to marvel then that how did he learn so much of physics and that everything was on his fingertips. And I marvel today that he continues to be so enthused about teaching. <clears throat> In those days of chalks and uh, blackboards, I was always intrigued as to how he derived all the mathematical expression without any help, and how he can conveyed the complex <coughs> concept in a simple manner. I recall that to teach us the kinetic theory of gases, he used to hit the wall to see I am the molecule and how that's how I create pressure. So all those things he used to do that and I still remember every single lecture of his vividly. My respect to you, sir, and I truly privileged to be able to see you and to be a student in your class today. A year ago, I had the good fortune of meeting Professor Gatak and worked with him in some committees of the Indian National Science Academy. And since then, we have been in close touch, including the fact that he kindly gave me a gift of his book on Meghna Saha. Teachers like Professor Loknathan and Professor Gatak brings me in any word, would bring in anyone the urge to be a student again, sit in their lectures to relearn and rediscover the innate charm of the basic sciences. I therefore thank Professor Arun Pratap and Professor Tushar Pandya for taking this initiative as also including me in this webinar series and allowing me to relive my student days. I'm happy that the Gujarat Science Academy and the MS University are organizing this webinar. This is the third webinar which Gujarat Science has been involved with the universities at uh, Rajkot, the Saurashtra University, Gujarat University, and MSU. I'm truly pleased that the participation today is 5,000, including many in the Facebook. This is not only a celebration of science, but also a celebration of two dedicated te teachers and they're acclaimed genius in teaching and communicating science. They are truly the Amitabh Bachchans of communication, science communications. And so the house is full. I'm pleased to inform that only recently, the Indian Academy of Sciences, seeing our success with these webinars, have offered to join us in future endeavors to conduct similar lectures. And I'm, I'm, I'm very positive that INSI will also follow the suit. So we have more to do. In the next few minutes that I have, I'd like to share my thoughts with you. I'm not going to talk about quantum mechanics because if I talk, I'm sure there'll be some fault somewhere found by Professor Loknathan or Professor Gattak. But I'd like to share with you with my anxieties regarding the future that is unfolding at a very rapid pace and in a manner unprecedented. These few minutes will be a digression from quantum mechanics, but I do hope that I leave you with some thoughts which we can discuss sometimes in the future. Friends, we are in, in times of all pervasive uncertainty, where everything around us is unpredictable, where there's a huge information and technology explosion delivered to us by the minute 
at an ever fasting rate. And we do not know how much the information that we get is fake or real. We only know that the world of tomorrow will not be the same as the world of today. And we do not have any clue of what the new normals of living, working, teaching, learning, and socializing will be. The only thing we know that the future living and working would be orthogonal to what we have learned so far. Pandemics coupled to the new disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics that are coming rapidly will imply that a large number of skills that we create today will become redundant. Marshall Kerr has listed 15 areas, including medical diagnostics to teaching, that will be totally revamped in the next five years. Also, to go out of the window will be the concept of permanent jobs. All the jobs will be work-based, skill-based, time-bound assignments. And this will be a calling for a change of mindsets. A teacher will be called to teach a particular section of a particular subject and that's it. And then the rest, somebody else will teach who is the best in that game. This implies that the teachers, colleges and the universities will have to prepare students in altogether different manner. They will have to be the students who can reconfigure themselves constantly with newer skills. Constant learning and reinventing oneself will be the new mantra. Recent results from the schools of Gujarat with over 60 percent students not clearing mathematics implies that as teachers, we have lots of work to do. And I think we need to realize that even in science, our contribution to the national science is 3%. And Indian contribution being 3%, we are looking at 0.01% contribution to global science. There's a lot of introspection we need to do. There will have to be more emphasis on teaching mathematics, computational sciences, instrumentation, entrepreneurship, social sciences, and so on. Innovations can occur only when we develop a faculty of keen observation on being able to find areas of needs and then buttress them with your entrepreneurship skills to provide marketable solutions. This will call for an experimental exposure to experimental sciences. And this is one area we have lacked a total, we have totally forgotten the experimental aspect, experimental science aspect of our teaching. The schools, we used to have laboratories, we don't have laboratories now. And something has to be done in some way, and as teachers, we need to think about it. We also need to imply that the teachers should get a proper working environment with remunerations that are sufficient to be able that they can upgrade themselves regularly. I do feel concerned that the level of payments of teachers in private universities is absolutely low. And how can we prepare a future generation when we don't even recognize the role of teachers in the society. Webinars like this can be used to evaluate to a student's skill set. It's time right now that the teachers and the students work together to develop a new course structures to conform to emerging changes in the workplaces. We need to think afresh. We need to take students on board to see what is it we should be teaching and learning together. A linked aspect is that webinars have a limited reach because it's only limited to students who have a laptop and internet connections. There are millions out of there who are as good, as skilled, but do not have a laptop or internet connection. And we have to find ways to reach out to those millions as well if India as a country has to prosper. There are many people who do not even have a phone, but they are bright minds and S30 film indicates to you the, that the students can be bright anywhere. <clears throat> and they are the majority. How do I make a student remote in a remote college in Gujarat or a remote village in Gujarat benefit from a Loknathan or a Ghatak? And how do I excite him about science that he comes to the forefront tomorrow? It's a moot question that we need to address to. And we need to go beyond webinars to various other means of interaction with its students. We need to find out ways to upscale our efforts 
and we have a role to play. And there's the vice chancellor mentioned and the Pankaj mentioned that we have a tremendous role in communication to play. We cannot be sitting idle and not doing it. The teachers will have to be the future drivers of nation building as they have been always. To end and seeing the way the things are in the country, I would like to re-emphasize the need to train our young minds to be good human beings, to be rational thinkers, to be evidence-based analytics, people with concern for society, people who are inclusive in their approach and have an ethical value system. I think ethics, social inclusion should be a part of course curriculum, even for science students or even for humanities students. And that cannot be underscored. I once again compliment Professor Loknathan, Professor Gattak for the continued passion for the teaching and communicating science. And I wish them years of successful teaching career, healthy career. I'm very truly delighted that I have seen Professor Loknathan after 53 years. I hope I'll continue to see him more often than now. And thank Dr. Pratap and Pradya to including me at the last minute. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, for your valuable comments. Sir, as you said, the role of laboratory is very important, the role of physics teacher. Sir, we'll consider your remarks and we'll take it very seriously, sir. Thank you very much for spending your valuable time and spending uh, your precious time for our students. Uh, friends, uh, before we invite Professor Loknathan, sir, for his talk, uh, we have a physics educator as uh, Professor Dr. Madhusudanji here. Uh, he is associated with the uh, Nehru Planetary of Science and he will introduce our eminent speaker, Professor Loknathan, sir. So with this brief introduction of Dr. Madhusudanji, I will invite him to introduce Professor Loknathan. Madhusudan. Dr. Madhusudanji. You? Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to make a small correction that I'm not a doctor. I'm a Mr. Madhusudan. Uh, sorry, please excuse uh, me, sir. Uh, so even Newton would not have guessed that action at a distance would mean a webinar like this. My only qualification to introduce Professor Loknathan is that I have spent close to the last 25 years in the education programs at our planetarium. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Lokanathan to you all. The task of introducing him is an onerous one because he is well known to all of you, either in person or through his books, articles, and research papers. Hopefully, I will say more of Professor Lokanathan that is less known to most of you. I must highlight from my perspective two important events in Professor Lokanathan's life, both of which have a strong bearing on me personally and on the institution where I work. Number one, Professor Lokanathan was born. Number two, he came to JN Planetarium Bengaluru to teach physics. And I shall quickly go over what happened between these two events. Professor Lokanathan obtained his PhD from Columbia University in 1957. Later, he was a research scientist at Oxford University for about seven years. Then he worked at IIT Delhi for a few years before moving over to Jodhpur University and finally to University of Rajasthan in Jaipur, where he retired as Dean Faculty of Science. He produced close to 100 papers in particle physics and high energy nuclear physics. His group in Jaipur collaborated in experiments at CERN Geneva. Apart from his research in particle physics, he's a great teacher, as all of you know, uh, and he has inspired generations of students to do science, more importantly, the right way. His work at CDPE alongside Professor Babul Al Saraf and others is well known and has benefited many. Our planetarium is one such beneficiary. Professor Loknathan made an important decision to spend his post-retirement period in the calm and sleepy city of Bengaluru, known as Pensioner's Paradise those days, 
Well, it is neither calm nor sleepy anymore. It's a fortunate coincidence that Professor Lokanathan settled down in Bengaluru and his, and his world line coincided with that of Professor C. V. Vishweshwaras, the founding director of JN Planetarium, the Black Hole Man of India, was contemplating on an ambitious and non-formal educational program for UG students at the planetarium. And what a coincidence it turned out to be. It was unlike any of the coincidence events that Professor Lokanathan must have studied. Particle physics and cosmology are anyway. Also, Vishweshwara and Lokanathan mean the same, Lord of the Universe. Professor Lokanathan, along with Professor Bala Ayer, renowned general relativist and one who played a key role in the direct detection of gravitational waves, began to teach in the UG program at the planetarium known as REAP, or Research Education Advancement Program, it had a modest beginning in 1995. It is an experiment in education by itself and a successful one, successful one at that now. Over the years, it has shaped more than 100 students into researchers of top quality. Some of them are now back in REAP, it's time to teach. Professor Lokanathan's contribution to REAP is immense and immeasurable. It taught electrodynamics, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, and anything that students wanted to learn from him. Unsurprisingly, his style of teaching went well with the students, and he enjoyed teaching in a non-formal atmosphere without having to worry about completing the syllabus or setting up question papers. Students had made their own collection of Lokanathanisms. I'm sure this is uh, a trend in other places too. He was very fond of saying, sometimes admonishing students when they use jargons to explain science. That is English, peak physics, he would say. Or he would say, those are details, tell me the essence. These were very profound thoughts that students imbibe. To him, science is all about making connections. He established them with effortless ease among seemingly unrelated ideas. Having connected, he would tell the class, do you see that? And he would be the only one seeing that. It would take a while for students to realize what he was actually uh, meaning to see. Professor Lokanathan is also instrumental in setting up a moderate conceptual physics lab at the planetarium that enables students to see physics unfold rather than verify results. A character that has been built into our laboratory education over the years now. I'm sure by now Professor Lokanathan must be feeling uncomfortable listening to all this. About Professor Babulal Saraf, once Professor Lokanathan said, there was one constant in Babulal Saraf. He was passionate in his beliefs. If the intensity of his passion was unusual, its authenticity was unquestionable, he said. I think these lines apply equally well to Professor Lokanathan himself. I once again thank Professor Arun Pratap and Professor Pandya for giving me this opportunity to say a few heartfelt words about Professor Lokanathan. And uh, introduction was just an excuse. Now I request Professor Lokanathan to begin his scientific talk on the birth of modern physics. Thank you very much. Shall I start? Yes, sir. Very good. Uh, Pro Professor Bias, Professor Joshi, can you hear me all, by the way? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, Very sir. good. Professor Joshi, Professor Ghatak, Professor Singhvi, Professor Joshipura, Professor Pandya, and Professor Arun Pratap. Madhusudan, Mr. Madhusudan, has said lots of things <laughs> and uh, well he's such a wonderful wonderful scientist that uh, well all i can say is that my fondness for his him for him as a teacher he's going to be a, a much better teacher than i was in fact he has always been he's a wonderful uh, work he does in the planetarium 
I'm honored to be invited to be with you. And I thank all the organizers and the organizing, all, all the organizations. Many years ago, I spent a delightful few days in Baroda at your famous university as a guest of Professor Arun Pratap. Uh, that was about 20 years ago, he tells me. And I'm honored to talk to you today. I would have enjoyed doing it face to face, but even apart from this lockdown, a webinar is probably a better option for such an old man as, as myself. But you, young active scientists, may be encouraged to recall that Isaac Newton had come up with his theory of gravitation in about 1665, I think, not from his normal residence at Trinity College, Cambridge, but in isolation in his family estate some 100 kilometers away due to the plague, it, there was a very severe plague that uh, and de de devastated much of England, including Cambridge. Well, still isolation from communicating with others may be all right for a Newton, but I don't recommend it as for, serendip for serendipity. Science is very much a social activity. I very much hope that you will all very soon be able to resume your normal life in your institutions. And my blessings to all of you that you will achieve success in your work and enjoy a full intellectual life. My blessings to all of you participants. Now, uh, the Next slide, if I may ask, if, if you can see the slide, uh, that is the first birth of, I'm going to talk about the birth of modern physics. The next slide, ah, this is a slide which shows two popular images of Isaac Newton. They are so popular, I don't have to tell you. One of them is about the apple falling from a tree well, the one on the left is uh, where his family estate. Apple falling from the tree. And the other is of his famous experiment using a glass prism to show that sun's rays spread out into colors. The, form, the apple story is probably apocryphal. It's probably not true, but it's a great metaphor for his discovery that the dynamical laws of the earth and of the heavens are the same, that the apple falling is the same thing as the moon falling towards the earth. Well, the prism experiment was a prelude to a brilliant experimental technique called spectroscopy that was to play a very key role in the birth of modern physics. And I am a little amused that great apple falling story was the birth of a very beautiful subject called classical mechanics, which was largely due to Galileo and Newton. And it was a very sophisticated development. And on the other hand, his other discovery leading to spectroscopy was going to be if you like, it threw spokes into the permanence of classical mechanics. And it was in fact, played a very big role in the birth of modern physics. The names of Fraunhofer and Bunsen are enshrined in the history of spectroscopy. Now, we are told that late in 19th century, a young aspiring scientist was told not to look to physics because there was nothing new to discover. 
and the roof fell <laughs> on classical physics more or less around that time what happened i want you to tell this story briefly probably as a fable well it's a true story it may be it, i want to talk to you like a fable if only to encourage you to listen what is all a joint banata brilliant speakers can you hear me yeah yeah the other brilliant speakers will talk physics to you but i am going to tell you a story more or less i hope as the, about the birth of modern physics that it's my story it may not be exactly uh, 100% uh, correct in some ways maybe it's a slightly doctored version but it's my story well in his nobel lecture in 1929 prince louis de broglie recalled this period of the late 19th century and expressed and expressed himself like this he said some 30 years ago physics was divided into two parts firstly the physics of matter based on corpuscles and atoms which were supposed to obey newton's laws newton's classical mechanics and secondly radiation physics based on the propagation in a continuous medium so what's the problem well the two matter and radiation you could study it separately except for one big caveat they both exchanged energy matter and radiation exchange energy and momentum and they could reach equilibrium according to the laws of thermodynamics so they both had to obey the laws of thermodynamics well the next slide shows the after this you, the next slide if you if you can show the next slide einstein that's right well einstein with his sardonic wit once remarked that all the physical laws were impermanent except the laws of thermodynamics and you know even einstein's jokes you have to take seriously so what exactly did einstein mean by that well one of the problems to trouble the physicists in the latter half of the 19th century was the so called black body radiation uh, the undergraduate students well even in my days were beleaguered with this examination question in fact to if i may just <laughs> tell you a story uh, in those days we would say oh do saal se do teen saal se ye, this question has not appeared so it will definitely come in the next so we had to memorize the uh, physics of black body radiation now unfortunately it it was clouded in ethereal mathematics and hiding the simple physics there are broadly two ways now i am i perhaps i'm caricaturizing a little bit but there are broadly two ways in which matter and radiation interact one matter acts like a mirror simply reflecting the radiation without changing the frequency back and forth and like a laser cavity with a high q or the second is matter absorbs it reprocesses it processes it and reradiates it after processing it so that the frequencies it emits is not necessarily the same as the frequency it had and ultimately when equilibrium is reached there is a black body radiation which is an idealization of the second process where matter and processes and uh, uh, equilibrium is reached eventually the two matter and radiation when they reach equilibrium the radiation 
uh, absorb by the matter and emitted, they're exactly equal in every frequency interval. Now, in practice, how do you make such a cavity? Well, a cavity suitably blackened approaches this ideal, and the characteristics of radiation can be studied through a small hole from the cavity. And in fact, it was studied. Spectroscopy had advanced tremendously so that the frequencies of the radiation by the late 19th century could be studied very well, but not the intensity. That required the development of a very beautiful instrument called bolometer that came very late in the 19th century. But once that happened, the experiments produced the energy spectrum of this black body radiation. Well, you may think that that's only of technical interest. So what's the big deal? All this would have been just of technical interest, except for one thing. In 1660, there was a beautiful theorem due to Kirchhoff. Thank you. That, that, that the, this is the cavity and the Kirchhoff, the next slide will show you Kirchhoff, that is Kirchhoff. And Kirchhoff produced this beautiful theorem. What was the theorem? The theorem said that the nature of the radiation on the right, you see the spectra. Well, not all the spectra was already available in the experiments, but a, a good part of the spectrum was. He showed from pure thermodynamic laws, he proved the theorem that the nature of the, dis the distribution of radiation, that is to say the, the energy as a function of frequency, is only a function of the temperature of the system and not at all of the matter with which the cavity is made. It has nothing to do with it. Ultimately, the equilibrium distribution depends only on the temperature. So now it becomes very important, you see. If something is independent of the nature of matter, then it must be of a fundamental nature. So people took it seriously and they started studying it. So what was, what were, well, many of the laws like I, I won't go into the details, like uh, the displacement law of Vien. All that was established that the experiment showed that, that they were all well obeyed. So the, the uh, curves had to be taken very seriously. Now, you may think all that, well, what is the problem? The problem is absolutely fundamental by now. What is the fundamental problem? And that is where I want to again recall to you the great brilliant remarks of De Broglie. The difficulty of reconciling the data of this black body radiation is this. The fundamental matter was already known to be consisting of corpuscles and atoms so that its degrees of freedom, in other words, the, the way it can move around and absorb heat, the degrees of freedom were finite. They cannot be unlimited because it was corpuscular atomic. That was well known. Well, by then, kinetic theory of gases, all those things had become very uh, well studied. But Maxwell's theory had already also had great success. But that theory said radiation, on the other hand, moved in a continuous medium so that the degrees of freedom of radiation were continuous. It had unlimited number of degrees of freedom. So what is the problem? The problem is the thing that has unlimited degrees of freedom could absorb any amount of energy from the one with the limited degrees of freedom. And ultimately, what will happen is all the energy 
will flow from the matter to the radiation. And I will quote the exact sentence in, from his novel. By the way, you should, these days you can access Nobel lectures on the internet. I would strongly advise you to read, if possible, uh, the beautiful Nobel lecture of De Broglie. It is a very, very charmingly delivered lecture. And the, I, the relevant quotation is this, since radiation would have an insatiable appetite, ultimately, of its own record, all the energy will flow to radiation and the average energy per degree of freedom, because it has infinite number of degrees of freedom, the average energy will go to zero. The average energy represents the temperature. So ultimately, everything will go to zero. So in other words, complete shanti, shanti, shanti. There is no physics, there is nothing. This is a great crisis indeed. So this was the, actually, the black body radiation, in other words, is a heat capacity crisis. So this was the puzzle that engaged Max Planck. I must tell you that Max Planck, everybody thinks that this is the only thing he did. Not at all. He was already a great physicist. He had done tremendous work in thermodynamics. But he had taken up this as one of the key points that worried him. And it is said, well, I'll cut the story short. It is said that around late, one late evening, I think it was October 1900, he produced his magical formula to show that the, the zero temperature crisis doesn't arise and the energy distribution, the formula is, is written on the blackboard and I think you have a, you have, I hope, uh, I had circulated uh, the, some of the material of the talk, the magical formula. The magical formula shows that the energy distribution does not go to infinity at high frequencies. On the other hand, it stays finite. And he produced this with a very sophisticated argument based on entropy. I'm not going to reproduce that argument. You can look it up, but it's a very beautiful argument. But nevertheless, it had its problems. And he realized he had done something very great. The story is he went on a walk that evening with his very young son who recalled it later and said, I have done something very important today. So he understood the importance of it. What was the importance? When a formula agree agrees even far more than your expectations, then you begin to worry. What is the new worry? The new worry is, why is it so good? Why is the agreement so good? That worried him. So he started producing even more derivations. I am told that he produced three or four derivations. I'm not going to go through all that. Instead, let me, however, sketch here one of the derivations of my undergraduate days when I memorized it from a textbook for a commonly expected examination question. All right. So the first thing is, what is the number of modes of radiation between nu and nu plus d nu? And well, that's a, not a very easy argument, but you can do that. And you will, it is easy to show that if you consider the modes, the modes are the degrees of freedom. The modes between nu and nu, nu plus d nu is eight pi. Actually it is four pi nu squared d nu upon c cubed multiplied by a factor of two to take into account the two polarizations of radiation. And that is the number of degrees of freedom. That's not very difficult to obtain, although it's a good, good, good calculation. And the next one, sorry, the next slide will show you the average energy per degree of freedom. Classically, you expect it to be just kT. Now, this is Planck's formula says the average energy is not that, it is h nu. How does that come about? Well, my memorized thing is that take the matter to be made up of oscillators, 
Why, why oscillators? Because that is e easier. And Kirchhoff has said it doesn't matter what matter you take because they should all produce the same answer because it is independent of the nature of matter. So assume that there are a bunch of oscillators of fundamental frequency nu, but here is where the new thing comes in that the acceptable energy, the, that the possible energies of this oscillator are only multiples of h nu. Moreover, those states which are multiples of h nu are occupied according to the famous Boltzmann's canonical law. Well, a little bit of this calculation, by the way, this calculation is, is uh, for, for one thing, you have many textbooks who do it. I studied it from Max Bond's Atomic Physics, a beautiful book, which is probably even today available, and it, it shows you how to derive this. Now, what is wrong with this derivation? Well, there's nothing wrong with the derivation, but the, the derivation says that all the blame on the limitation of the energy exchanged is on the matter. That this, it is because of the discreteness of the energy of the oscillators. Well, Einstein was unhappy with this. What was his unhappiness? Well, Einstein had actually, by that time, as you know, had already shown from his photoelectric effect that radiation behaves, behaves as though one quantum of energy can hit and liberate a photoelectron from a metal. And it is like a collision of two particles, H nu and the electron, you know, that famous photoelectric equation. So Einstein thought that it is not proper to blame it all on matter, that probably this has to do with the nature of the radiation itself. And to bolster his ideas, he had derived a famous formula for the fluctuation of the energy of the black body radiation distribution. And this formula had been derived earlier by Willard Gibbs, but Einstein did not know this. Remember, in those days, there was no internet and poor Einstein would not have known so easily that Willard Gibbs had derived it earlier. Einstein had a great admiration for Gibbs and in fact, he expressed it publicly. And he said, if I had known it, I would not have done it. But anyway, Einstein had derived this and he applied this to Planck's formula and then showed that the fluctuations expected according to Planck's formula shows that at high frequencies, for the radiation behaves as though it is made up of bundles of energy of H nu, and the graininess, the atomicity, is not entirely because of the matter, but, but radiation is also grainy. Even its limitation is of the degrees of freedom because of its lumpiness. And in fact, later he also showed through his famous papers on his A and B coefficient, you can look it up, and he showed that these quanta also carry momenta of h nu over c, which you, h nu upon c. Well, that was the status. And then imagine at that time, Einstein receives a letter from an unknown Indian. The unknown Indian was Satyendranath Bose who wrote to him and said that, please, can you forward this paper of mine for publication? And, uh, you know, unlike others, Einstein, when he received any communication from anybody, he would read it. He was a kind man and he immediately saw this was a great idea. So what was Bose's idea? In fact, Bose knew that he had done something important. And he himself said it, and he said, you will see that 
I have derived this coefficient h nu squared d nu upon c cubed independent of electrodynamics in my own way. All right? And what was that way? Well, to cut the story short, I will tell you what was that way. If you, well, today's, in today's hindsight, it's a very easy calculation, but not in his time. And I will tell you what it is. All that you do is you take a phase space and divide the phase space into cells of H cubed. And the number of cells between P and P plus DP, P is the momentum of the radiation, P and DP would be 4 pi P squared DP, except that there's a factor of two necessary. So he introduced two also. So it would be 8 pi P squared DP upon C cube. Now you put P equals H nu over C and lo and behold, you'll get 8 pi nu squared upon C cube. Now, I also must tell you that Bose did not fully understand the implication of the factor of two, but he, he introduced it because it gives the correct answer. Now, don't blame Bose. This was in 1984, 19, sorry, 1924. And whoever heard of spin of a particle and let alone a photon, as he had conceived it. So, because the electron spin was discovered later, about a year or so later. So, that idea was to come later. At any rate, Bose's formula was a brilliant uh, conjecture. And this was not the only th beautiful thing he did in the paper. The, the later part of the paper derived what you would now call photon statistics, you can go through it. And that also had brilliant ideas. And ultimately it was generalized by Einstein into a great thing called, we now call Bose-Einstein statistics. If I may just venture into a slightly offbeat remark, I had the great fortune of inviting Professor Bose, when I was teaching at IIT around 1964, Professor Bose, I, uh, the students wanted to hear him. So I requested him, he was in Delhi at that time, I requested him to come and talk to the students. He agreed, except that I had to do, bring him from his house to talk to the students and take him back, which I did. So Madhusudan has given my biodata, the most important part of my biodata is that I, act, I acted as chauffeur for the great Satyendranath Bose. That is my great achievement, if you like. A charming, great man. Anyway, that's a side story. Now, so that was the state. So it was a very great achievement. And by now, the photon became a very, very big thing. It came, so it was also, it had joined, if you like, the club of members of particle physics. The photon was also a particle now to be reckoned with. But it brought in problems with it. This membership, this new member, the photons, brought problems with it. What was the problem? The problem was that if the photons could show wave and particle properties, perhaps so could matter. And as you all know, de Broglie, this is what de Broglie got a Nobel Prize for, his conjecture, etc., etc. Now, I don't want to rehash that, except to warn you that the textbooks do not tell you the whole story. De Broglie, his thesis was far more sophisticated than the textbooks tell you. And I'll just hint it, if only to persuade you to read his Nobel, uh, his thesis, which is also available on the net. You can read his thesis, beautifully written. And roughly speaking, this was the point he made. He said, 
supposing nu zero is the frequency of a particle at rest, like an electron, and you would equate h nu zero equals m zero c squared according to Einstein's relativity, and therefore nu zero equals m zero c squared upon h. Now here is a particle at rest. You understand the right hand side, but the left hand side nu zero is a frequency. What is the frequency about? What is happening inside a particle at rest? What is the frequency? Whose frequency is it? And De Broglie said, all right, maybe some motion is taking place inside the particle, some periodic motion, and that is nu zero is the frequency of that inner, pe inner periodic motion. If that is the case, then for, a, for an observer with respect to whom the particle moves, in which case, instead of nu zero, he will see the frequency as nu. And the nu, instead of being larger, it will become smaller because time is dilated to the moving observer. And therefore, if time is dilated, the frequency will be less. And therefore, instead of nu zero, he would see the frequency as nu zero times one minus square root of one minus v squared upon c squared. On the other hand, if you use Einstein's energy relation, it says h nu now equal to m, m zero c squared upon square root of one minus v squared c squared. The two frequencies, the nu and the other one, they are not the same. So the inner periodic motion is different from the frequency nu from Einstein's relation. What is this new thing? And that is where de Broglie said, I thought of a phase wave that accompanies all particles, that every particle will be accompanied by a guide wave with a phase velocity. I won't go into the details, read it. And it is that phase velocity, uh, that phase wave, the guide wave, which is responsible for all the new diffraction phenomena, everything that particles exhibit. In fact, this idea of a guide wave was exploited years later by David Bohm, the late David Bohm, also a brilliant person. And he, uh, he proposed it even as an alternative to the modern quantum mechanics but unfortunately it has not taken uh, it has not been taken as a substitute for quantum mechanics because it has other problems that's another story so this is the this is what happened and uh, i the sorry so I, 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 I wanted to tell you this story because I want to persuade you to read this De Broly, uh, thesis and his Nobel lecture yourself. You will enjoy it. All right. So finally, the important thing is that by now you say that the, the graininess is not associated with matter alone, but the radiation also is grainy. And uh, therefore, you now have to reckon with particle wave duality of, of radiation and matter. So what of it? Well, the uh, final point I want to make is that, that that duality of wave and particles is one of the problems that continues to trouble it is only one of the many problems that continue to trouble the interpretation of the modern quantum mechanics. I'm not going to talk about it, others will. And, and I also wanted to tell you that the birth of modern physics of that period was in one sense a brilliant short period. And of course, as you well know, that in 1913, uh, the early quantum theory was bolstered tremendously 
by the new theory of atom that Niels Bohr had came up using the photon idea already. And so the early quantum theory had a marvelous time for about 20 to 25 years, from 1900 to 1925 or so. And it reminded me of a, of a title of one of the Ernest Hemingway short stories. I think the short story is titled The Short Happy Life of Ernest Macomber, you should read the short story anyway, not, <laughs> it's a fine story. But I am here, I'm tempted to say the short happy life of early quantum theory. Unfortunately, the short ha happy life could not last. Part of the trouble, only a part of that trouble was because of the particle wave duality which you had to understand. But there was also other things like Zeeman effect, anomalous Zeeman effect. There are many more things that dogged the early quantum theory and therefore a newer version had to be established. The newer version, the quantum mechanics, came in, the, in 1925 and 26. And that has continued to last until today. And as, as Professor Arun Pratap has, has uh, made the title, and he and others of this webinar, that continues with great success to this day. The only problem is that despite its very great success, there are still problems of interpretation that people are slightly unhappy about. And I leave it to others to talk to you. And it has been a great privilege for me to talk to you. And I thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. There are a couple of questions which we would like you to answer, sir. Yeah. Uh, one question is, uh, can quantum mechanics solve all the natural problems that we have today? All the which problems? That, that is the question that uh, somebody has asked. No, no, all, uh, all the which problems, I missed the word. Natural, natural, natural problems. All the, all the problems of nature. Now, that, it's a question which I really cannot answer. It's a very important question. And let me put it uh, uh, a little more uh, precisely. I have tried very hard to understand what are the problems of quantum computing, for example. Mm -hmm. Namely, what to make a quantum computer. Well, it's going on. The research is going on. What is the stage? Others will tell you about it. Are the problems really only problems of technology or are there more fundamental problems that we have not understood? Right. Frankly, I cannot answer it myself. That is one of the difficulties. I mean, the great Feynman said, no one understands quantum mechanics. He probably said it humorously, but if he said it, I certainly can say it. That the problem is we don't really know if quantum mechanics is in a position to answer all natural problems. The chances are that we still have some way to go to understand the implications and the interpretations of quantum mechanics. Sorry. Okay. Uh, another question is basically about quantum entanglement. Uh, somebody is asking quantum entangle is uh, possible on stars and quasars. It's probably the distance scale they are talking about. Ah, uh, now listen, uh, I, I, I would have said something as a layman. You have a person who is going to talk about it. Yeah. I think, if you don't mind my saying so, I think yeah. he would be in a much better position to answer. But right. I can, the only thing I can tell you is that uh, the great, um, what was his name? Wheeler, Wheeler. The great Wheeler had come up with several puzzles related to the question that you are asking. So I think some of them you may you may even refer to Wheeler's work. Quantum, not merely quantum entanglement. He posed problems of delayed choice experiments, etc. So they are very beautiful experiments that are going on. And uh, I think the 
brilliant, the distinguished speaker will be a bit in a better position to answer. He's going to talk about it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, the, another question which Ram Kumar is asking uh, What are the limitations of quantum mechanics? And can resolving these limitations would make us understand the universe better? Well, it's, I, isn't it partly related to the previous question? Uh, yeah. All right. The, the beauty of quantum mechanics is, is its great success. All right. Well, uh, a great deal of the technology that we have is related to quantum mechanics. And you cannot deny it. Can it solve all problems? That is a tall order. By that, uh, well, I, well, I tell you, it's a very difficult problem uh, of all kinds of, it has all kinds of aspects. One of them is the mind-body problem. And I think the Roger Penrose has written books about it. And one of the questions that he addresses is this, are human brains really subject to the exactly the, such, the same laws, in which case they will also obey quantum mechanical laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or, or human beings, when they make a discovery, they go outside the realm of these laws, some of the discoveries. He himself believes that there is no that algorithmic knowledge or explanations on the behavior, on 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 quant on the understanding that human brain and all our thinking is explained by quantum mechanics he doesn't believe it himself he has written books about it so it's a it's a it's it's not a question i can answer but my gut feeling is that there's more to it than just saying that quantum mechanics can answer all our behavioral problems. Okay, yes. thank you very much, sir. As I right. can see, there are now more than 50 questions on Zoom and even some more on Facebook also. And mm. obviously we cannot take all of them right now. So we'll, we'll compile the list of the questions and send it to you, sir. And oh, right. very, good. Answer, very good, very good. I will respond, the... I will respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll circulate that thing among the participants later. Right. right. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, very, very enlightening. My, my, ble my blessings okay. to all the young participants. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Questions are still coming up, but we'll, we'll uh, select the questions and send you again later. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Good afternoon once again to all of you. Friends, now our next eminent speaker is Professor Ajay Gatak. But before we invite Professor Ajay Gatak, sir, we have with us uh, Professor K. N. Josipura. He was a professor of physics and head of the physics department of Sadar Patel University. At present, he is a general secretary of Indian Association of Physics Teachers and is actively involved to upgrade physics education and physics teachers in our country. He is also actively involved for over 47 years in the educational program and outreach program at all levels. He was a former director of Anand District Community Science Center, working under SP University, Sardar Patel University. He has conducted many outreach programs in the Anand District to promote the basic science among the students. Frank is a fellow of Gujarat Science Academy and actively involved in the science education, novel research programs and science outreach programs of our academy. Professor Josipura is a popular science writer, excellent science communicator, excellent communicator, I mean, uh, orator and contributed many articles in scientific magazine. With this brief introduction, I request Professor Josipura sir to introduce our eminent speaker, Professor Ajay Ghatak sir. Over to Josipura sir. Thank you so much. Welcome also on behalf of the IAPT, which is the co-organizer. Quantum ideas coming alive in this wonderful webinar. Mm -hmm. 
friends, as such, the quantum mechanics will be reaching 100 years in 2026. But from 1900 to 2026, there have been so many remarkable uh, developments. And we have here the next speaker, Professor Ajay Ghatak, to tell you more about this. Professor Ajay Ghatak is currently Meghna Saha Professor at uh, the National Academy of Sciences. He received his BSc from Agra College, MSc from Delhi University, and PhD from Cornell University in USA. After a research associateship at Brookhaven National Laboratory, he came back to India, joined IIT Delhi in 1966. Professor Katak has research interests in fiber optics and quantum mechanics. He has authored several books, including the famous UG textbook, on optics, which has been translated in Chinese and Persian. His books include quantum mechanics, theory and application. We are so happy that both the eminent uh, authors are here. Professor Loknathan, we have heard him, and now Professor Gattak. He has written books on fiber optics, lasers, and optical electronics. And the last three were co-authored with Professor K. Thiagrajan. His most recent book entitled Einstein's Year of Miracles, E equal to MC square the light quantum and spatial theory of relativity. He's a recipient of 2008 Speak Educator Award in recognition of his unparalleled global contributions to the field of fiber optics education worldwide. The 2003 Esther Hoffman Beller Award instituted by o Optical Society of America in recognition of his outstanding contributions to optics education. And he is a recipient of uh, 1979 CSIR SS Butnaker Award for Outstanding Contributions in Physical Sciences. Very recently, Professor Gattak received the OSA 2020 Sang Lee Award for his seminal role in the development of fiber optics and guided wave photonics and for pioneering, optic, pioneering optics education in India. He has been a lifelong passionate educator and now famous as webinar speaker. With this, uh, let us uh, welcome Professor Ajay Ghatak to deliver his webinar talk. Professor Ghatak, please. Thank you. Uh, can you see these slides now? Right now, we cannot see the slides. Uh, I said slide share. Can you see? Now it's okay. We can see. No, can you see now? Yes, sir. Can I start my talk? So I have, about, I have about one hour from now. It's already late. If you want, I can shorten it a little later. We will see. Thank you so much for this kind introduction, Professor Joshipura. Professor Vyas, Professor Arun Pratap, Professor Madhusudan Rao, Pankaj Joshi, Professor Pandya, Ashok Singhvi. I'm indeed delighted to participate in this webinar and listen to Professor Lopanathan. My talk is uh, quite elementary and uh, it's a textbookish kind of a thing. <laughs> that evolution of quantum theory, it is meant for students, not for senior teachers. So the senior teachers who are here, bear with me. And uh, let's start. Is my voice clear? Absolutely, sir. No problem. These are the... There are so many books on quantum theory. Innumerable number of books on quantum theory. And uh, the classics, I have listed four classics. One by Dirac, who is one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And of course, the beautiful Feynman lectures. And as Professor Loknathan said, David Bohm is considered as one of the great authorities in quantum theory, his own book. And then uh, quantum mechanics by Kohen Tanuji and his colleagues. And as you all know, Dirac is a Nobel laureate. Feynman is a Nobel laureate. David Bohm should have been an all Nobel laureate. And Cohen Tanuji is also a Nobel laureate. And as someone said, I do not recall who, Dirac's articles and his book are like poems. 
but they do not contain figures. And in this photograph, 19, someone's mic is on. Uh, so yeah, this is a 1962 photograph of Dirac talking physics, I presume, with Richard Feynman. And the photograph here is that of David Boo talking about spirituality and uh, philosophy with J. Krishnamurti. And then this is Kohen Tanuji receiving the Nobel Prize. And this quantum mechanics book is translated by two of my very good friends, Nicole and Dan Ostrowski. So I'm very fond of that book. So there are many, many books. Each book has its own presentation, own evolution of quantum mechanics. And I'm going to give you my own, my own evolution. This is all well known. Whatever I'm going to say is all well known. I learned, so did Professor <laughs> Lokanathan, quantum mechanics and nuclear physics from Professor Dalat Singh Kothari and Professor Ramesh Chandra Mujumdar at Delhi University. And I studied there from 57 to 59. That was long, long, long back. And I still remember Professor Majumda telling me, telling us that uh, he said that we will study quantum mechanics. I said, no, sir, you are teaching us nuclear physics. And he would always say, what is the difference between nuclear physics and quantum mechanics? Nuclear physics is just quantum mechanics. So everything is quantum mechanics. So I had the privilege and great fortune, and so did Professor Lokanathan of having outstanding teachers like Professor Kothari and Professor Majumdar. And here is a photograph of mine. On the other side is Professor Ajit Ram Verma. And this is Professor D.S. Kothari at a meeting in, in IIT Delhi. And then I had the great privilege of learning, of having, uh, taking two courses on quantum mechanics. One was on basic quantum mechanics and the other was on uh, Intermediate Quantum Mechanics by Hans Bethe. He was a great teacher, great teacher, meticulously planned out lectures at Cornell University during 1960 to 62, where I did my PhD from. It was a great experience to listen to them. So I owe a lot to them. And then when I joined IIT, then uh, Professor Lokanathan was there and he was teaching quantum mechanics. So I used to sit down in his classes. So in a way, he's also my teacher. And uh, that's how I got very close to him. He left very soon. And then Professor Soda had asked me to teach quantum mechanics that he was teaching. And so I took it on from there, would discuss with him. And uh, that's how the book got evolved. And it's my great pleasure and honor that I was associated with, with a personality like Professor Lokanathan. This webinar is coordinated by Professor Arun Pratap. I'm very grateful to him. And now I see that, that it is not just Arun Pratap, but many others who have just helped in organizing this webinar. I'm very grateful to them. So this is a photograph of myself with Professor Lokanathan. What I'm going to follow is my our own book on quantum mechanics. And then, as was mentioned, I have a book on optics also. There I have my new chapter on quantum theory. And uh, there is a simpler book for, uh, that I have written for school students, trying to tell them about Einstein's year of miracles. The concepts that are embedded in E is equal to MC square, the light quantum and special theory of relativity. So I thought I would just mention that. Ever since, this is a very, very simple talk. Ever since man could see, he has been wanting to know what light is. And here is a sadhu uh, worshipping the light from the sun. So Isaac Newton, actually it was much before Newton that uh, René Descartes had also put forward the corpuscular theory of light. But I will not go into that detail. Isaac Newton in his book on optics wrote that are not the rays of light very small bodies emitted from shining substances. And since his book became very popular, so the corpuscular theory of light is usually attributed to Newton. But it was much before him that people even derived Snell's law using the corpuscular model of light. 
and of course using law of conservation of momentum isaac newton also derived snell's law in his famous book on optics but why why is particle model because one of the thing is that light can propagate through vacuum the very fact that we can receive sun light on the surface of the earth it can propagate through vacuum and a wave requires a medium and that is why people believed that light was indeed uh, uh, in the form of particles here is a photograph of the man on the sky and light also travels in straight lines and uh, you can see the sharp shadow why i show a photograph on the moon is because that almost no light enters the geometrical shadow if you are in a shadow outside your home as i have shown in this photograph there is still some light which comes in this is not due to the wave nature of light this is not due to diffraction it is because of the scattering and as we know that uh, there is no atmosphere very little atmosphere on the surface of the moon and so therefore there is no light which can enter the shadow and if you are standing on the moon and reading your book you will not be able to read the book so therefore light as you can see from this photograph does travel in straight lines in almost straight lines and so therefore people believed in the corpuscular model of light then around the same time as newton Huygens put forward the wave theory of light. You all know what is a wave. If you have a calm pool of water and you make a pin move up and down, it emanates circular ripples. That is the transmission of a wave. So if you have two sharp needles, one of the characteristics of the wave is that they interfere. If you have two sharp needles on the surface of water, each one will send out circular ripples. the displacement the resultant displacement of a molecule will be the algebraic sum of the displacements produced by each wave and will cause the interference pattern so the interference pattern that you see is a manifestation of the waves that are generated in this experiment and this is an actual interference pattern produced from two point sources vibrating in phase in a ripple tank so such interference experiments were not seen with light and it was only in 1801 that thomas young carried out this beautiful experiment he allowed sunlight to pass through a filter and then through two pin holes and he formed the straight line almost straight line actually they are hyperbolic interference pattern on the screen so he saw the he could say once he carried out this experiment that light plus light could produce darkness and uh, and that would only be possible if light was a wave phenomenon i will hasten here to mention that the original thomas young's experiment did not involve two slits it involved two small tiny holes so with two tiny holes you do get the straight line interference pattern and with simple physics which i'm sure all of you are familiar you can calculate the wavelength by measuring the fringe width and d small d is the distance between the two holes and capital d is the distance between the this screen and this screen so you sure you know this is this diagram is taken from the feynman lectures if you have a gun which throws out bullets and you do the same two hole experiment then the bullets will all either pass through hole number 1 or hole number 2 and if p1 is the intensity distribution when hole number 1 is open and p2 is the intensity distribution that hole number 2 is open then when both holes are open the bullets will either go through hole number 1 or hole number 2 and the resultant intensity distribution will be p1 plus p2 so if you have a simple corpuscular model of light in which it sends out tiny bullets tiny particles tiny so they would not interfere they will either pass through hole number 1 or hole number 2 and will never produce the interference pattern so the very fact that 
in the Young's experiment, it could produce the interference pattern, as you all know, establish the wave nature of light. And then immediately after that, there were many experiments which showed he calculated, Thomas Young calculated the wavelength of light and he found that it was about half of a micron. And so therefore interference experiments were difficult to perform and diffraction experiments also. But with carefully many experiments were performed and by within 10, 12 years, it was established without any doubt that light was indeed a wave. There were diffraction experiments by Fresnel, Arago, and many, many other people. You know, I thought I will tell you <laughs> that people say that Thomas Young was the last man who knew everything. And in fact, there is a book. In fact, they say that even for Enrico Fermi or even Richard Feynman. But there is a book with the title that last man who knew everything. And it has Thomas Young's photograph on the cover. So the main, thing, the main thing that started bothering scientists was light was a wave, but how could it propagate through vacuum? During that time, during the beginning of the 19th century, the laws of electricity and magnetism were getting developed. And uh, Faraday said that a changing magnetic field, if you move a magnet up and down, then it generates a current in the coil. And so therefore, a changing magnetic field produces a changing electric field. And this is known as the Faraday's law. And this experimental law, Maxwell put in the form of an equation with which I'm sure all of you are familiar. Then you have Ampere's law, that you have a current. And if you have a ca conductor carrying current, it produces a magnetic field. And uh, again, Maxwell put that in the form of a vector equation, which looks like this. Then Maxwell made a revolutionary contribution. He said that, that just as changing magnetic field, what is the physics of this Faraday's law? A changing magnetic field produces a changing electric field. He said that not only a current can produce a magnetic field, but a changing electric field can also produce a magnetic field. And he therefore introduced the concept of displacement current, delta D by delta T. The, if you have two plates of a capacitor, when it is getting charged, then the electric field changes with time and it produces a magnetic field. And he justified the, uh, the term by with consistence with the equation of continuity. Those are details I'm sure most of you are familiar. But he physically, he said that not only a current produces a magnetic field, but a changing electric field can also produce a magnetic field. And introducing the concept of the displacement current revolutionized physics. I must mention here one thing, that the concept of the fields, today we take electric and magnetic fields for granted, is because of Michael Faraday. Before that, we have forces that exist between two like charges or unlike charges. The concept of the field was introduced by, by, by Michael Faraday. So he said that if there is a charge sitting here, it produces a field. And so therefore, if you put another charge there, then it will experience the force because of the presence of the electric field. So therefore, these are the Maxwell's equations in free space, which he wrote down. This is the displacement current. I'm assuming the current is zero. And then if you write a wave-like equation for the electric field, if you substitute in these two equations, it satisfies that. So therefore, a wave-like solution is a solution of Maxwell's equations. So he, if you substitute this equation, let us suppose in the first equation, you take the curl of this equation and then integrate with respect to time, you will get the expression for magnetic field. And then you substitute both these equations in the second equation, you will get the value of omega by k, which is the velocity of light, velocity of electromagnetic wave, and which is equal to so much. So with the law, the Maxwell actually some people say Orested had also put the laws of electricity and magnetism in the form of vector equations.
Maxwell's equations are experimental laws. He wrote down the laws in the form of equations. He substituted the a wave-like equation, something like that. In the equation, he said he found that they satisfied, and he then found out the corresponding magnetic field. So, if there is a changing electric field, there has to be a changing magnetic field, and if there is a changing magnetic field, there has to be a changing electric field. And from just from the equations, he could calculate the velocity. So he Maxwell predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves, and he calculated the velocity of the electromagnetic waves in vacuum. And he showed that this is about 300 million meters per second. And with faith in the rationality of nature, that this and the velocity of light as measured by Fuso, which was also around 300 million meters per second, these two numbers cannot be accidentally equal. He put forward that light must be an electromagnetic wave. For these students, I will just repeat what I had said. He found that the wave-like expressions for electric and magnetic field are solutions of Maxwell's equations. And so therefore, he predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves. He then calculated the velocity of electromagnetic waves. And he found that that number was very close to the velocity of light that was measured by Fizeau around 1849. And he said that these two numbers cannot be accidentally equal. And so therefore, light must be an electromagnetic wave. So associated with a light wave, there is an oscillating electric field. And the oscillating magnetic field, oscillating electric field creates an oscillating magnetic field. An oscillating magnetic field creates an oscillating. That is how an electromagnetic wave propagates through free space. So around 1864, Maxwell predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves and said that light itself is an electromagnetic wave. And therefore, one can say, God said, let there be Maxwell's equations. And this is what Feynman has written in his famous Feynman lectures, and there would be light. Heinrich Hertz verified this. He, he created the uh, standing electromagnetic waves from an LC circuit and uh, calculated the velocity of these electromagnetic waves and showed that this value is very close to the velocity of light. I thought I will tell you one experiment. You see, if you have a glass prism like this, and if the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, total internal reflection takes place. And uh, if you put another prism, but with a slight spacing between the two, so there is an air gap between the two prisms. Then a small portion will tunnel through. This is known as frustrated total internal reflection. And it is a characteristic of the wave nature of electromagnetic waves. This, this will not be possible in, in, the, in, a, in a simple corpuscular model. So a wave theory, a classical wave theory, predicts this optical tunneling, which was first observed for millimeter waves by Jagadish Chandra Bose. I thought, I will tell the students that around 1894, Jagadish Chandra Bose in Kolkata, Calcutta, at that time it was known as Calcutta, was the first to demonstrate optical tunneling using millimeter waves. So then, right from, as you all know, I'm sure, gamma rays to X rays to ultraviolet, to infrared, to microwave, to radio waves that you receive on your cell phones, they are all electromagnetic. They have different frequencies, but they all travel with an identical velocity of 299792458 meters per second. This is now an universal constant. And the visible portion of the spectrum, which corresponds to a wavelength ranging from 0.4 microns to 0.7 microns, occupies a tiny region of the electromagnetic spectrum. You have X-rays, ultraviolet, gamma rays, and then microwaves, radio waves. They are all electromagnetic waves. So Maxwell's electromagnetic theory was a great success. It was a great success. It could explain reflection and refraction properties of solids and everything. And Max Planck had said, 
that Maxwell's theory remains for all time one of the greatest triumphs of human intellectual endeavor. And as Professor Lukhnathan mentioned, that it was Lord Kelvin in 1894 who had said, there is nothing new to be discovered now. All that remains once people understood what light really is, and that light is really an electromagnetic wave, all that remains is more and more precise measurement. Then, uh, Einstein, in his year of miracles, where he was like Newton, he was in total isolation at the Swiss patent office, and he wrote five outstanding papers which changed the pace of physics, and that was his year of miracles. And in the second paper in his year of miracles, Einstein wrote, as Professor Lokanathan mentioned, that light, radiation energy, these are his own words, radiation energy consists of indivisible quanta of energy, E is equal to H nu. And in a later paper, he said that these also carry momentum, which is H nu by C. And this is the photoelectric effect experiment. You have a surface like sodium or potassium or cesium, and ultraviolet light is falling, and it ejects the electrons. The maximum kinetic energy of the electron is equal to H nu, which is the energy of the photon or the light quantum, and a constant which depends on the property of the metal. This is known as the Einstein equation, which was verified to a tremendous degree of accuracy by Robert Millikan. But Robert Millikan did not believe in Einstein's light quantum, which we now call as photon. The word photon came in 1926, and the light quantum came in 1905. So the wave particle duality was introduced for the first time by Einstein in 1905. So, this Einstein equation was verified to a tremendous degree of accuracy by Robert Millikan, and he carried out beautiful experiments. But he did not still believe Einstein's light quantum. Nevertheless, Albert Einstein received the 1921 Nobel Prize in Physics, not for his general theory of relativity, not for his special theory of relativity, not for the concept of the light quantum, because at that time, in 1921, Einstein's light quantum was not believed her. He got the equation for this Einstein equation. This is incidentally the Nobel medal that was given actually to Einstein, because Einstein's name is written on the back. And Robert Millikan received the 1923 Nobel Prize in Physics for his work verifying the Einstein equation. Then, after Einstein got the Nobel Prize, Arthur Compton did his brilliant Compton scattering experiments, where a a light beam, an X-ray photon or a gamma ray photon hits an electron, gets scattered and uh, to a smaller frequency or a larger wavelength. And from simple kinematics, using the fact that the energy of the photon is H nu and the momentum is H nu by C, he calculated the, the, the wavelength of the scattered photon. And that agreed very well with the experiment. It was only after Arthur Compton's experiment in 1923. And remember, Einstein had got the Nobel Prize in 1921. Actually, he got the prize in 1922, along with Niels Bohr, but he got the 1921 Nobel Prize. And at that time, Einstein's light quantum was never not believed. It was only after Arthur Compton's experiment that people started taking seriously the concept of the light quantum, which is now known as the photon. So Arthur Compton received the 1927 Nobel Prize in Physics for his famous. Then in 1897, then in 18, as you all know, in 1897, the electron was discovered by J.J. Thompson. We know that the mass of the electron is known to 10 decimal places. The charge of the electron is also known to 10 decimal places. It can be deflected by an electric field or a magnetic field. So on the back of our mind, we think that it is a tiny particle which can be put, put bent here and taken there and things like that. It has a very well-defined mass. It has a very well-defined charge. J.J. Thompson received the 1906 Nobel Prize for this. Then Louis de Broglie, as Professor Lokanathan very beautifully explained, I will just give a summary of what he said that this relation P is equal to H nu by C, which describes the momentum of a photon, is also valid for electrons. 
and the for the for the detailed arguments i think the best thing is as professor lognathan mentioned that you go through the 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 nobel lecture beautiful nobel lecture of i will not go into the detail but he said that electrons protons and neutron neutron was not discovered electrons protons or any particle must also exhibit wave like properties he predicted that that is the beauty of theoretical physics that he predicted that i that that electron should also demonstrate a wave like thing and its wavelength is given by h by p and one of the justifications that he gave was because at that time niels bohr had given the bohr model his famous bohr model of the atom according to which the for the hydrogen atom the electron rotates in circular orbits and the angular momentum is such that mbr is equal to nh by 2 pi so he said louis de broglie said that this bohr quantization condition implies that 2 pi r is equal to nh by mb nh by p so it is n lambda so each discrete orbit of my bohr atom is like a stationary wave and so therefore the electron forms a stationary wave justifying the discrete orbits of in the bohr model of the atom so that's what he said in 1924 so that's how he one of the justification that he gave so he actually i thought i will tell that niels bohr had visited delhi university when i was a student there and this is niels bohr he gave a beautiful lecture that here is myself and there is professor rp mitra professor alag and i think this is professor ds kothari who is escorting professor niels bohr and it was a great pleasure listening to him at delhi university in 1959 so we are all prehistoric men most of your parents will not be born around that time so niels bohr received the 1922 nobel prize in physics and de broglie received the 1929 nobel prize in physics for his discovery of the wave nature of electrons he predicted the wave the important point that the student should note is this that he predicted the wave nature of electrons which was experimentally verified in 1926 and 27 so it was experimentally verified in 1926 by davison in germany in the united states and gp thompson son of jj thompson gp thompson in the united kingdom so here are two photographs the the electron diffraction pattern which is shown here by by aluminum foil and the x ray diffraction pattern and see the similarity see the similarity of the two pattern so so therefore the it it uh, if you and and if you calculate this experiment has proved beyond doubt that electrons do manifest itself in a wave characteristic and that the wavelength of the waves associated with the electron is given by the de broglie relation which is given by lambda is equal to h by p and the, and as as now listen to this carefully listen to this carefully so davison and thompson shared the 1937 in nobel prize in physics for their experimentally discovery experimental discovery of the diffraction of electrons by crystal and it was only after their discovery that that louis de broglie had got the nobel prize for that great prediction so therefore the wave particle duality now listen to this i'm talking to the student listen to this carefully that the wave particle duality was first introduced by albert einstein in 1905 but let us consider the electron so the question is is the electron or a proton a wave or a particle it's a wave or a particle some books write sometimes it is a wave sometimes it's a particle sometimes some books write it is a wave as well as a particle those are not quite the right answers the right answer is as richard feynman writes here richard feynman giving his famous feynman lectures in caltech that they are neither waves nor particles huh. so they are not then not particles so then the question arises what are they then you have not answered my question whether the electron what is then the electron the answer to that question is that it is described by the wave function psi 
What is this wave function psi? It is the solution of the Schrodinger equation. And then you will immediately say, where did I get that equation from? And I again quote Feynman, and he says, where did we get that equation from? The answer is nowhere. It is not possible to derive it from anything you know. And where did it come from? It came from the mind of Schrodinger. So you see, in these last two slides, I have summed up the basic concept of non-relativistic quantum mechanics that, that the electron or the proton or the neutron, or the alpha particle, or even the fullerene molecule is neither a particle nor a wave. Then what is it? I don't know. The correct answer is I don't know. It is described by a wave function psi, which is the solution of the Schrodinger equation, which cannot be derived. So many love the Schrodinger equation. They have tattooed on their back. The internet is full of, full of photographs like this. So I will give you a very heuristic derivation of the Schrodinger equation. It does not, it lacks rigor. Every book has its own way of introducing Schrodinger equation. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> if someone asks you to derive the Schrodinger equation, you can say, you can simply say that Schrodinger equation cannot be derived. So let me write down a classical plane wave. I write the displacement associated with the classical plane wave is e to the power of i k x minus omega t. And then somehow we introduce the wave particle duality. So I write the de Broglie relation, t is equal to h by lambda, which is equal to h cross k, where k is equal to 2 pi by lambda. So I can write k is equal to p by h cross. Then I have the Einstein relation, which is p is equal to h cross omega. So then I substitute for k p by h cross and for omega e by h cross. So I say that the particle of momentum p and energy e will be roughly described by this equation. And then for a classical non-relativistic particle, non-relativistic particle e is equal to p square by 2m. So then I write psi of xt, px minus et, p is, e is equal to p square by 2m. And I differentiate with respect to time and multiply by ih cross. If I do that, I will get p square by 2m psi. And then I differentiate twice with respect to x. So if with respect to x, p is a parameter here. So I get p square and I multiply by minus h cross square by 2m. I get p square by 2m. These are simple differentiation of this exponential factor. So the right hand sides are equal. So I make the left hand sides equal and I have a heuristic derivation of the Schrodinger equation for a free particle. So then I take this as a Bible. I do not worry about this derivation. And I then solve the Schrodinger equation. Let me do that. So if the particle is in a potential field V of X, then E becomes P squared by 2M plus V of X. So, so I can write E psi is equal to so much. And this is the one dimensional time dependent Schrodinger equation for a particle in the potential field, with most of you may be familiar with. So instead of a one-dimensional wave, if I had taken a three-dimensional wave, like this, pxx plus pyy plus pzz, and I have to differentiate this with respect to x, with respect to y, with respect to z, then I will get the three-dimensional Schrodinger equation. And let me mention, let me tell you something. As I'm sure all of you know, a major portion of non-relativistic quantum mechanics a major portion of non-relativistic quantum mechanics is just the solution of the three-dimensional Schrodinger equation. The spin of the electron is put from the top. In the spin of the electron, I understand it by saying that it behaves like a tiny magnet. And if I make a measurement of any Cartesian component of the magnetic moment, it is either plus mu zero or minus mu zero. So with that, if I incorporate, then, then whether you take the Zeeman effect, whether you take the uh, uh, hydrogen atom problem or the helium atom problem, they are all solutions of Schrodinger equation. So in his 1926 paper, Schrodinger solved the wave equation, solved the Schrodinger equation, 
for the hydrogen like atom problem and found the discrete states as you most of you will know and that he did so he completed the solution of the hydrogen atom problem in his 1926 paper itself and he found the discrete energy levels of the hydrogen atom that was the great initial success of the schrodinger equation and he explained the emission and the absorption spectrum of hydrogen so for the remaining 10 15 minutes or so i will discuss simple solutions of the Schrodinger equation for a free particle, one dimension. So I take my Schrodinger equation as my Bible, as the truth. So for a free particle, an electron or a proton is described by this equation. What is an electron? It is described by the wave function. So if you solve this equation, so it's in, this is the starting equation, I must try to solve it. I solve it by the method of separation of variables and I obtain a solution like this. In fact, we had used this to obtain this. So what is P now? P is a number, which is the momentum, which goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And so therefore, the most general solution of the Schrodinger equation is a linear superposition and it is therefore this. This is a wave packet which is the wave packet, <coughs> which is a localized wave packet. And let us suppose, and in 1926, Max Born used the Schrodinger equation. In 1926 itself, Max Born used the Schrodinger equation to deduce that mod psi squared dx is the probability of finding the electron between x and x plus dx. And AP squared, <coughs> is the momentum distribution. This is the probability distribution and this is the momentum probability distribution. This is the position probability distribution. Is the probability <coughs> of finding the X component, the momentum of electron between P and P plus D. So let me give you an example. I assume that at T equal to zero, the wave function of the of an electron, the electron is described by a Gaussian wave function. So that if I mod square that, then the probability of the electron lying between x and x plus dx is given by a Gaussian function. And so this is the solution of the Schrodinger equation. I write at time t equal to zero and I get this. I then, this is a Fourier transform relationship and I take the inverse Fourier transform to get this. So that if I know the wave function at time t equal to zero, I can calculate A of P by using this relation. And then I substitute A of P here carry out the integration to study the time evolution of the wave packet. So if the electron, my question is, if the electron is localized at x equal to zero, how, what will it be at x is equal to t at a later time? So I calculate A of P, the mod square of which is the momentum probability distribution. And then I, Substitute it here and evaluate this. So this is my psi of x comma zero and a of p is given by this. And if I substitute it here, carry out the integration, I get this. this is the, the, the integral of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. Uh, sorry, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So physically, if the particle is localized within a distance of sigma zero at t equal to zero, then its momentum distribution function is localized around the mean momentum p zero, which is h cross by sigma naught. And so therefore, this is my uncertainty relation. And so therefore, the uncertainty relation is contained in the solution of the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation contains everything. 
all solutions of Schrodinger equation are consistent with the uncertainty principle. You do not have to write that from the top. I'll tell you a little more. So if you did that, if you did that evaluation, then an electron at t equal to zero is described by this localized wave packet. So that at t equal to zero, it is somewhere localized like this. This is the real part of psi of xt. At a later time, it moves with a certain group velocity and it is localized somewhere here. And at a much later time, you see, it also broadens because of dispersion. Why is it dispersion? Because the omega k relationship is not linear. E is equal to h cross omega is equal to p squared by 2m. So omega is non-linearly related to k. And so therefore, there, that is unimportant. Now, let me consider this experiment. Let me consider this election. So I have a tiny alpha particle, which is described by this wave packet at t equal to zero. And is approaching a potential barrier. And as you, as you all must have calculated, the potential barrier has a reflection coefficient and a transmission coefficient. Then you say, let us suppose there's a 50% reflection and 50% transmission. Then you will say that half the alpha particles will be reflected back, half the alpha particles will be transmitted back. That is not a correct answer. The correct answer is that the alpha particle, which is described by this localized wave packet, if you solve the Schrodinger equation, then at a later time, and I have done this calculation myself, there is a reflected wave packet and a transmitted wave packet. A single electron or a single proton is described by this wave function. And at a later time, it is described by a wave function, which is here as well as here. Now understand this point. This is the most subtle point of quantum mechanics. So the proton is here as well as there. If you have a detector, then it is either here or there. Then it will be either detected here or there. But if you do not make a measurement, then it is at both places simultaneously. This is something very little subtle, but difficult to understand. But this is what quantum mechanics tells us. And I will give you one more example. So two more examples. So I have a single photon source. So one photon comes in and a beam splitter. So let us suppose the beam splitter is a semi-reflecting glass plate, 50% reflection, 50% transmission. So if I ask you, what does that mean? You will say that, let us suppose there are 1,000 photons per second, 500 will be reflected, about 500 will be transmitted. That is not correct. A single photon is described by a localized wave packet, and when it interacts with the beam splitter, it is reflected as well as transmitted. And these two wave packets can be millions of kilometers apart. So it is here, a single photon is here as well as there. But when you make a, if you put a detector, you try to make a measurement, then the, then the, then the photon or the electron, which is at both places, collapses to being either here or there. This collapse of the wave function is something unique to quantum theory. Let me give you another example. I considered the single slit diffraction pattern. I have a plane wave and I consider a plane wave which interacts with the slit. And you have this, uh, it is given in any book on optics. And you calculate the intensity pattern produce the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern. And it is sine square beta by beta square, where beta is equal to pi b sine theta by lambda, where b is the width of the slit, smaller the width of the slit, greater is the diffraction. Now you want to do the quantum mechanics of that. So you assume that the initially the wave packet the electron or the proton or the neutron is described by a wave function, which is something like this. You calculate the corresponding AFP and the momentum distribution function. And if you do that, 
and it is given in our book or any other book then the then solution of the schrodinger equation tells us that the probability that the x component of the momentum lies between px and px plus dpx is equal to this where beta you see the similarity of the expression here and there so therefore the electron is almost horizontal before it interacts with the slit the slit imparts a momentum and the momentum distribution is the same as the fraunhofer intensity distribution and so therefore smaller the slit greater will be the momentum distribution greater will be the spread in the momentum greater will be the diffraction and again you have contained in the solution of the schrodinger equation the basic concept of the uncertainty principle let me do one more experiment so this is my diffraction of a photon or an electron by a narrow beam or slit with p now i do the double slit experiment now if i do the double slit experiment then if you do classical optics you get the product of two terms which is the single slit diffraction pattern multiplied by the two point interference pattern and you get an intensity distribution which looks like this this is done that beta is equal to pi b sin theta by lambda and gamma is equal to pi d sin theta by lambda then uh, you want to do the corresponding quantum mechanics so you take a localized wave packet like this that the electron is either here or there no sorry it is at both places so therefore you do that and you calculate the probability distribution for the momentum and you find the same expression as the front of our diffraction pattern physically therefore the electron passes through both the slits simultaneously electron passes through it is described by a wave function which is present here as well as there and as dirac very beautifully explains this in his book it interferes with itself so this is the single electron probability distribution which is the same as the classical intensity distribution so that the electron or the proton passes through both the holes simultaneously interferes with itself to produce a probability distribution which is the same as the classical fraunhofer diffraction pattern so how does the electron pass through both the holes simultaneously does it split into half and half no it does not that no one understands because on the back of our mind we know that electron has a definite mass and a definite charge so does the half of the mass go here half of the mass go no no it does it is there so if you make a measurement if you put a telescope to find out which hole the electron has passed through then it will be either hole slit number 1 or slit number 2 never both the slits and once you make a measurement then it will destroy the interference pattern so you do this experiment this is again taken from the feynman lectures with the electron gun so electrons as you as you think it is a tiny particle then you expect that it either passes through hole number 1 or hole number 2 so if hole number 1 is open then you get an intensity distribution like this if slit number 2 is open then you get an intensity distribution like this and class and you should expect that the electron because it is a tiny particle that it either goes through hole number 1 or hole number 2 and it should produce an intensity pattern like this but when you do the experiment you do not get this when you do this experiment you get this you get the interference pattern and you can explain this only if the electron is made to pass through both the holes simultaneously and you can do this experiment with single electrons one electron or one photon one by one 
And if you did this experiment with large number of electrons, slowly the interference pattern will evolve. Arun Pratapji, how much time do I have? I can't hear you. I I'm can't hear you. You see, Fine. that is the difficulty of a webinar because if you were in an actual class, you will feel, find that some of the students are sleeping and then the time is to leave. <laughs> <laughs> the time is to leave. So, right now, it is, uh, it is up to you. You can have uh, 10 15 minutes more. Are you sure? Yeah, are there still I, students there? Are students yeah, I think so. What about uh, Dignes? Yes, sir. Five, five, yeah. seven minutes more. Five, seven minutes more. Yeah. Ten minutes more, okay? okay ten minutes, minutes more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you see, this is one of the most beautiful experiments in physics. This is the two slate interference pattern. And many people have done this now. This figure is from Tonomura. This is the electron diffraction uh, interference pattern produced by 10 electrons, 100, 3000, and this is 70,000. So quantum mechanics predicts a probability distribution where will an individual electron arrive, no one can say. One can only ascribe a probability distribution. And so therefore, quantum mechanics is probabilistic in nature. Classical mechanics is deterministic in nature. There is a conceptual difference between the two. And so therefore, this is considered Robert Kreese has written a book. This is considered as the most beautiful experiment in physics. And the, the probability of arrival when you do the experiment with 70,000 electrons, slowly the interference pattern. I hope all of you can see that. Here is a photograph of a, that. This, experiment, this was the experiment with the electrons. This is the experiment with photons. This is with 3,000 photons. And you get 3,000 discrete spots. And this is what Feynman very beautifully describes in his volume three of his famous lectures, that electron or a proton or neutron always arrives in lumps. You detect either one electron or no electron, never half of an electron. Photon also arrives in lumps. It always arrives that either you detect one photon or no photon. And quantum mechanics gives us the probability distribution of its arrival on the screen. And only then, so if you have 10 photons, there will be 10 spots. This is not what wave theory predicts. So if you have 28 million photons, then slowly the phase emerges. So David Bohm, who became a philosopher later, the most fundamental theory now available is probabilistic in form and not deterministic. So here I would advise all the students to listen to the Feynman Messenger Lectures. Go to YouTube and write Feynman Messenger Lectures at Cornell University. He gave a beautiful course of six lectures on fundamentals of physics. And the sixth and the final lecture is somewhat what I have tried to tell you today. So he says, and read this very carefully, electrons do not behave just like particles. These are his own words. They do not behave just like waves. Electrons in orbit around the hydrogen atom are not somewhat like a cloud or fog of some sort surrounding the nucleus. It behaves like nothing that you have seen before. Well, there is one simplification. Electrons behave exactly the same way as photons. And then he finally says, you see, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. This is what Professor Lognathan also said. I don't think he said it in a joking way because the part I had heard one of the other lectures also on YouTube, the part that one does not understand is the fact that an elect now we have experiments with fullerene molecules. They have demonstrated the, the interference pattern. So what we do not understand is that how does one electron pass through both the holes simultaneously? And in that sense, we do not understand quantum mechanics. But Schrodinger equation and the basic 
laws of quantum mechanics are remain absolutely valid so if you have an unpolarized light let me give you another example of 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 quantum theory the simplest example that we need in schools is the phenomenon of radioactivity i have a solid let us suppose i have a solid which is a radioactive substance let us suppose this solid consists of 10000 uranium atoms and let us suppose its half life is one day so we say that in one day 5000 will decay in the second day another 2500 so you can see some atoms will decay in the next minute some atoms will live for 10 days which atom will decay or which atom will de- will remain no one can predict they are governed by the probability distribution and this half life can be calculated from first principles using quantum theory so here is another experiment unpolarized light falling on a polaroid it polarizes and it has an another polaroid at an angle and the intensity as you know falls off as cos square theta this is the law of mahler's now i have a single photon source the end should be here and the one by one photon comes in and you have when it passes through this polaroid a x polarized photon so when you have another polaroid which is at an angle then the question is will it pass through or will it not pass through so there is a probability associated with it and that is embedded in the quantum theory the probability for the photon to pass through the second polaroid is cos square theta and if the experiment is conducted with n photons and if n is very very large then about n cos square theta photons will pass through one cannot predict the fate of an individual photon i will just briefly do three more minutes three four more minutes and tell you one more experiment which i am sure will be discussed in more detail later this is a doubly refracting crystal calcite crystal what it does is <clears throat> that if you have a laser beam coming in it splits up into two orthogonally polarized beams so one may be the propagation is in the z direction and the one may be x polarized and the other may be y polarized so it's a xy device so by orienting the crystal i can make it xy or uv or sigma eta all axes are perpendicular to the direction of propagation so an unpolarized beam or a polarization so it will always split up into two polar linearly polarized beams one is one at right angles to each other and i if i rotate the calcite so if this is the polarization xy then if i rotate the calcite it straight can be uv and it can be sigma eta so you have a 45 degree polarized beam you pass through a calcite xy device this is y polarized and this is x polarized if you pass through so these are the if you rotate the crystal it can be a xy polarized or uv polarized so i so if you have a photon single photon which is 45 degree polarized will it come here or here it is in both the beams until you make a detection it's in a superposed state so this concept of superposition is unique in quantum mechanics so it is both a linearly a, a superposition of x polarized and y polarized so i will conclude by just mentioning one experiment that i have a calcium atom at the center and it emits two photons and the, the polarization of the two photons are at right angles to each other if one measures it x polarized then the other will be automatically y polarized the other will collapse to a y polarized state and the two photons are said to be entangled photons so therefore before the measurement is made 
one does not know the polarization of the second photon. So this can be say millions of kilometers apart. So if one of them is measured, is passed through an XY device, <coughs> and it measures X polarized, then the other will collapse. So this Einstein could never reconcile to, because he thought this violated the theory of relativity. Because as if you can send a signal with a great speed, faster than that of light. But, uh, but, so that is the, I look forward to listening to the second lecture. So I will just uh, say that according to quantum theory, the polarization of the photon traveling to the left or to the right is not known before one of them is measured. And if the photon going to the left is passed through an XY device and it is found to be X polarized, then photon going to the right collapses to a state in which polarization state is Y polarized. And similarly, if it is passed through a UV device and it is found to be U polarized, then it's found to be V polarized. So whatever happened to one particle would thus immediately affect the other particle wherever in the universe it may be. Einstein called this as spooky action at a distance. And then he wrote in the paper that if quantum theory was correct, then two particles which are millions of kilometers apart can be entangled in the sense by determining a property of one of the particles the property of the second particle can be instantaneously changed. And so therefore, he put forward the, this came to be known as the EPR paradox. And 30 years later, experiments confirmed that the predictions of quantum mechanics, namely Einstein's impossible prediction was in fact correct, that instantaneous changes in widely separated systems. So it's almost two o'clock. Let me. So then we go to Bell's inequality. I have a very simple derivation of Bell's inequality, which I have put now in the quantum mechanics book. So I'll end here and uh, and uh, by saying that uh, that uh, so my last two slides are. So I have a derivation, simple derivation of Bell's theorem, which I'm sure someone else will do. Bell theorem as one of the most profound discoveries since Copernicus. Bell delivered a death blow to the local realist picture of the world. Many experiments have demonstrated that the predictions of quantum mechanics for entangled particles are fully correct. And the world is really as crazy as predicted by quantum mechanics. So although many of us do not understand quantum mechanics, but the prediction, it is a hundred years later, predictions of quantum mechanics are absolutely correct. And so Einstein in 1917, when he wrote the paper on stimulated elevation, he said that for the rest of my life, I will reflect on what light is. And in 1951, a few years before his death, he said, all the, when he was old and matured, all the 50 years of conscious brooding have brought me no close to the answer to the question, what are light quanta? Of course, today, every rascal thinks he knows the answer, but he is deluded. So I'm just an old storyteller. I do not know what the truth may be. I tell you the story as it was said to me, quoting Sir Walter Scott. So these are the references. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Wonderful talks. Okay. <laughs> Sir, there are some questions in question and answer. Oh so my God. You can choose some from no, them. I, I can see the question answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. Uh, Teja Vardhan writes that as in double slit experimental electrons in which as we want to probe the electron, it changes from wave behavior. No, 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 no. It interacts with the does it imply it all sizes of matter? Yes, of course. Yeah, so so it does not change from wave, wave to particle. The correct answer is that it is neither a wave. Don't think of it as a wave. Don't think it as a particle. Think it is described by a complex wave function psi. And that it passes through both the, that 
that wave function is finite in both the slits. And, uh, and it passes through both the slits. It interferes, the wave function interferes with itself to produce a probability distribution, which is the same as the classical probability distribution. Why even a single photon can show interference pattern? Someone said, said what if the quantum field theory and GTR be unified? I don't know. <laughs> there is a famous saying, I know what I know, I also know what I do not know. So that I do not know. So another question, Mr. Ohit, Rohit Hadra says, why even a single photon can show an interference pattern? A single photon is, you see, a single photon passes through slit, or passes through a slit. It undergoes diffraction. So, but you have a detector here. Only one photon will be detected. It can never be that it is spread out. Classical theory will tell us that even for a very weak wave, it will be spread out in all parts of the screen. But quantum theory tells us it, it predicts a probability distribution on the screen. Where will it appear? I don't know. No one knows. Not even God can. So <laughs> God does not know future. So when you make a measurement, it collapses. Oh, this is very beautiful. That, that the electron or the photon is everywhere. It is described by a wave function which is everywhere on the screen. The process of measurement makes it collapse to one of the detectors. Can I? There's another question. Respect, uh, sorry, Suren Shalendra Shivastar. How can we explain displacement current? Displacement current is physically, I can tell you, that if you have a changing electric field, you don't require a current. A changing electric field produces a magnetic field. That is the basic physics of, uh, of uh, displacement current, which is most fundamental. Electric magnet, in, in, when you write the Maxwell's equations, electric field, cannot exist without the, the oscillating electric field. An oscillating electric field will produce an oscillating magnetic field, an oscillating magnetic field will produce an oscillating electric. So both, neither can exist without the other. Of course, you can have a pure electric field like, like in an electrostatic problem, like in an electrostatic problem. Is all electromagnetic waves made by photons? Oh, this is a little confusing question. Pragnesh uh, uh, Thukia. That, that electromagnetic waves, if you quantize it, uh, the, you get the concept of the photon. So, so what is light? So what is light? Light is described by photons. But it is not, does not mean that it is particle like. Maybe Professor Loknathan can get a, give a base. So let, it, let us suppose we ask what is an electron or a proton or a photon. They are all the same. They are described by a wave packet kind of a thing. This is how I, I understand. Hello. Yes. Yes. What is the reason behind optical tunneling? What is the reason behind oh, the optical tunneling? is a classical phenomenon. You, you solve the wave equation and, uh, and there is a certain, there is an evanescent wave which is created, which links one wave to the other. Medium. So it is a simple classical physics. It is not quantum mechanics, but, uh, uh, but when you do a tunneling through a potential barrier, then that is quantum mechanics. But if you have the experiment that I discussed, when you have two prisms, when you have two prisms, that tunneling follows from the wave nature. Uh, a, a wave will undergo uh, tunneling from one, one prism to the other. So there is no quantum mechanics there. There is just simple electromagnetic theory. If we can't Yeah, <laughs> I, I, the one question is, if we cannot conclude what electron actually is, then can we think, Shreya Ghosh, 
that all quantum mechanical particles are just solution of the solution. <laughs> I, I understand it this way that uh, that uh, that Schrodinger non-relativistic Schrodinger equation is just nothing more, nothing less, nothing more than the solution of the Schrodinger equation. You take the spin orbit interaction, you put the spin inside the electron, you take the magnetic field interaction with the, uh, and even the Stern Gerlach experiment, uh, you solve the Schrodinger equation and uh, uh, do that. So um, I look at quantum mechanics, I know very little mathematics. And um, you see, one thing that I can t share with my younger students when you are young, do as much mathematics as possible. I was not given the opportunity of learning as much mathematics as possible. And uh, so learn as much mathematics as possible. Today, even let us suppose you do not get those lectures in your, uh, 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 in your college or school, you can listen to YouTube and there are hundreds of lectures from general theory of relativity to mathematics to, to Euler equation to anything that Fermat's last theorem. So my advice to all of you is that learn as much of mathematics as possible in your summer vacation, when you have holidays and things like that, that even if you become a great experimentalist, that will help you tremendously. So that, uh, oh, how does the Schrodinger equation change in the relativistic case? Instead of E is equal to P square by 2M. If you write down E square is equal to P square C square plus M0 square C4, then you get the klein gordon equation, which is the relativistic Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. If you want it to be linear, then uh, in single derivative, then you get the Dirac equation. So Dirac equation is a relativistic equation. klein gordon equation is a relativistic equation. Schrodinger equation is a non-relativistic equation. Sir, I think we can close right now. Yeah, because there are more than 80 questions and we will compile the questions and send it to you. So uh, we can then uh, again uh, give it to the participants later. Because there won't be any end to any of these questions like this. Yes. Oh, but, Mr. would you have any problem? Did I make any wrong yeah. statements? I wanted to say, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. All right. There are, you know, uh, somebody had asked me, and they're asking you also, whether quantum mechanics answers everything. I will tell you one very simple thing that nobody has answered as yet. <laughs> yes, sir. Why, do, why are there so many electrons in the world and they all have the same mass? <laughs> and, and you know, and you know, long ago, the good old Feynman had a thick, not, uh, I think it was Wheeler, his boss, his boss had a theory. He said, maybe there's only one electron, it's going backwards and forwards in time. Mm. And <laughs> that's a very sophisticated idea, which didn't work either. But what I'm all the time trying to say is that it is not true that quantum mechanics can answer everything. There are many, many questions which are still outside the, at present, the outside the purview of quantum mechanics. So that's all that I wanted to say. So it's not true that quantum mechanics alone, uh, it has its own problems of interpretation as Professor Ghatak explained very clearly, namely measurement is one thing, oh, I, for example, uh, there are two formulae about radioactive decay. Mm. The probability is, decays exponentially. Mm. Mm -hmm. The second one is almost the same, that the number of particles which decay exponentially, which they are not the same. Probability is continuous. The number of particles cannot be continuous. Do you understand? So even at that elementary uh, uh, Rutherford, Rutherford Soddy decay equation, the way you write it, whether the number, the number of particles that decay 
cannot be anything other than integers. There's a very big problem and that problem is associated with the problem of whether information destroys what you measure. Anyway, Professor Gatak might have something to say about that. Thank you, Professor. Arun, you may conclude the session now. Students are saying that we are releasing the lecture of the professor, so uh, let him speak. <laughs> 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 but the, there is no end, so yeah. every good thing has to come to an end. So uh, now I request uh, uh, Jignesh Pandya, Dr. Jignesh Pandya, to to conclude, uh, uh, make a, some sort of concluding remarks and yeah. propose vote of thanks. Okay. Uh, actually, this was. A uh, very interesting and uh, what you can say once in a lifetime kind of experience for most of us. Uh, on the outset uh, of the first day, I can uh, I propose what of thanks uh, on behalf of the whole organizing team. Uh, first and foremost, uh, our honorable vice chancellor, Professor Parimar Vyas, sir, for his opening remarks and encouraging words. Uh, and he always supports us in this kind of activities and motivates us to do so. Uh, Another uh, person whom we would like to uh, thank basically will be uh, Professor Pankaj Joshi and uh, for his remarks and con uh, constant support for uh, the organization of this particular webinar. Obviously, Professor Loknathan and Professor Ajay Ghat, uh, Ghatak, they took us to a very uh, interesting journey right from the beginning of quantum mechanics to, uh, in, in fact, uh, after a long time, I was uh, enjoying a class of quantum mechanics when Professor Ghatak was taking it because normally I take the class and students uh, are on the other side. After a long time, I was on this side. So that was really a great experience, sir. And uh, we heard many things uh, from Professor Loknathan, which were basically uh, encouraging for youngsters also. And uh, he was basically talking about behind the scenes kind of thing for the quantum mechanics development. So thank you very much, sir, for all your inputs. Uh, I would like to thank Professor A.K. Sangvi, who basically likes to be called as a pro student of Professor Loknathan. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, obviously, we are very much thankful to Dr. Madhusudan from Nehru Planetarium who, for introducing Professor Loknathan to us. Thank you all. Thank you.